Great, uh, thank you, Diana, through the, the chair. Um, thank you for having me here today and I'll do a quick uh, five minute uh, session on the regional projections, the regional growth strategy in relation to uh, the work that happens uh, at the local, the local level. In terms of the projections, sorry, just, There's technical difficulty. <laughs> My slides won't advance. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, so in terms of the growing region, uh, as many of you know, and have seen the, some of the most recent work from Metro Vancouver, uh, by 2050, uh, the region is expected to, to grow by a million people, half a million houses and half a million jobs. And that is uh, from the regional projections that uh, we collaborate with uh, our local partners, uh, stakeholders and regional agencies, uh, along with uh, modeling work that we do in, in our planning analytics group here at the region. In terms of the principles of growth, uh, these have been long held uh, principles amongst the, the growth strategies over the past many decades. Um, and it's really about focusing growth in the right places, so our urban centers and our corridors, uh, supporting the creation of complete con connected communities. And this is in relation to the work that we're doing with TransLink and the regional growth strategy and linking transit investment and other service investment uh, to, uh, the, to communities across the, across the region to support accessibility, walking, uh, and uh, diversification of housing types. Um, protecting important lands from agricultural, industrial, as many of you know, on the industrial side, uh, we have a a very, uh, we have a very low vacancy rate, and um, we continue to uh, put a, a large emphasis on protecting those lands to support our economy across the region, um, and not doing it at the expense of other important lands like agriculture. Um, and the last bit is about uh, supporting better mobility choices. So this is uh, how do we invest in the infrastructure and support growth and uh, focus growth into locations that uh, can help us ensure that we uh, efficiently invest in our infrastructure across the region. In terms of uh, how we collaborate, um, as many of you know, the Metro Vancouver is a federation of municipalities and it's a continued collaboration as we, we don't have the entire knowledge base of what happens at the local level. And uh, we are trying to uh, plan regionally and deal with regional issues, but they also we also know they have impacts at the local level. And so it's a consistent, uh, collaboration between all regional uh, stakeholders and agencies and, and local partners, uh, particularly on the, the projection side, as there are many projects at the local level, investments um, and, uh, and infrastructure projects that can influence population growth. In terms of how the regional growth strategy interacts uh, with the local, uh, the local context is through the official community plan and most uh, jurisdictions across the region. In, in this instance, you have a regional uh, context statement at uh, Vancouver, but you're certainly working through uh, your current Vancouver plan. Um, but the intent here is an official community plan or a Vancouver plan uh, has a regional context statement, with, which is the link between the regional growth strategy and the local area planning context. So our regional projections uh, are a set of projections and they're really uh, at a regional focus. We don't have the capacity or do we get into a lot of the local uh, context because there are things in capital planning, uh, there are investments that occur uh, that we can't account for at a regional level across all of the municipalities. Uh, and so we keep our figures um, up at the higher level in terms of interprovincial migration, intraprovincial migration, and what is one of the larger impacts in terms of, of growth in our in our area is, is immigration. And that's relative to a lot of federal um, implications and decisions in terms of how many new Canadians uh, will be coming to our country. And then generally speaking, Vancouver, Metro Vancouver, sorry, uh, takes somewhere between 15 to 20% of uh, new Canadians into the region. And again, I, I wanna, I'm gonna go through uh, the projections here uh, very quickly. They're at a sub-regional level. You'll note that in Metro 2050, which has not been adopted by the board, but our current working model as we uh, move through the update, to update the growth strategy, uh, moving the projections up to a sub-regional level as um, primarily for the focus that we can't 
we don't have all the information to get into the more detailed local environment to do a lot of the planning, a lot of the um, projection work. And our projections are merely there to help um, support the work that the local uh, planning environment is undertaking. And so again, we build on a scenario uh, based model. We take in the characteristics, we do some ground truthing with the, with the local jurisdictions, uh, and then we produce the, the, uh, the projections. So from a population perspective, the, in the subregion, the Burrard Peninsula, and for the purposes of the subregion, it is the city of Vancouver, the city of Burnaby, and the city of New Westminster that form the Burrard Peninsula under our, our six subregional areas. And you can see the population projected to be 1.39 million uh, on the peninsula um, over the course of the next um, 30 years. Uh, from the unit projection, uh, 623,000 new units, uh, or not new units, sorry, we're going from, it'll be 623,000 units in 2050, my apologies, um, not uh, that amount of new units. Uh, so by that point, you can see roughly 200,000 units from 2016 to 2050 is, uh, is what the slide is uh, showing as the projection and, and equivalent uh, in the employment is about 820,000 jobs will exist on the peninsula within uh, by 2050. So uh, again, roughly um, a shade under uh, 200,000. Uh, Excuse me, it's a um, point of privilege, I guess here. I'm not sure that the slides are showing on both screens. Thanks, Councillor Swanson. We'll just check. I do see them on the orange cone screen that's being displayed to the public. And I also see them on the WebEx. I wonder, you may need to refresh your orange cone. Okay, sorry for the no interruption. Problem. Thank you. Please go ahead, Sean. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, and that's the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Sean. Uh, I would now like to invite Susan Haid, who is the Deputy Director of Long Range and Strategic Planning with the Planning, Urban Design and Sustainability Department as well as Edna Cho, who's a senior planner in housing policy within the planning, urban design and sustainability department. And they're going to provide some context for us around growth and planning before we move into our panelists. Susan and Edna. Great, thank you very much. And good evening, uh, Deputy Mayor and Council. As mentioned, I'm Susan Haid and I'm Deputy Director of Long Range and Strategic Planning here in the Planning, Urban Design and Sustainability Department at Vancouver. I'm here with my colleague, Edna Cho, Senior Housing Planner, to provide some very brief context for our workshop topic tonight and about where we are in the Vancouver plan process. So here's where we're at in the Vancouver plan. And as council is very aware, uh, we provided a, a big update in July as we've completed phase one and phase two of public consultation. And so we're now in this current phase on emerging directions and we're getting uh, ready for another round of public consultation, which is beginning with a series of council workshops this evening and this fall, which will include discussing data and growth. We'll also be hearing in these workshops perspectives from civic leadership and also a panel to explore city building approaches with planning experts. And in a very major way, we're, we're launching a month long intensive public engagement that is starting on October 25th and will include citywide forums, open houses, neighborhood workshops, uh, which are really focusing in on the emerging directions, the big ideas, the policy directions, and the ways we can grow in the future. So tonight's workshop is focused on data and growth. And before we turn to our expert panel, which is really the focus of tonight's discussion, Edna's going to walk us through a few slides to provide context and background data, specifically in terms of population, job growth, and housing. And I'd just like to say as, as follow-up to Sean's presentation, this is really um, the perfect moment to plan in the city of Vancouver with the regional growth strategy update, Transport 2050, the Regional Transportation Plan, and coming out of the pandemic, um, it is a key time for Vancouver to move forward with the Vancouver Plan um, in partnership with community. So over to Edna. Thank you, 
Okay, thank you, Susan. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Edna Cho, Senior Planner in Housing Policy in Planning, Urban Design, and Sustainability. Vancouver is the center city in a growing and prosperous region. We're the urban core, the economic engine, and a central destination for tourism and immigration. Although Vancouver makes up only 4% of the land mass in the region, we have 26% of the overall population, 30% of the dwelling units, and a third of the region's jobs. As Sean has already mentioned, the region has been growing with Surrey, Vancouver, and Burnaby leading the way in population growth from 2006 to 2016. And this population growth is expected to continue. In part, this growth is fueled by a strong economy. Along with Surrey, Vancouver added the most jobs in the region be between 20, 2006 and 2016. Vancouver is the region's leader in office space, with 70% of the region's office space under construction located in the city. Across Metro Vancouver, we're seeing growth across a number of economic sectors, from established ones such as information and cultural services to emerging sectors such as the green economy. As a central city, Vancouver plays an important and unique role in the regional economy. The city has a large and growing concentration of jobs in professional, scientific, and technical services. And we're noticing that certain sectors prefer a central city location that allows them to access Vancouver's large, diverse, and talented workforce. A defining feature of Vancouver's economy is its diversity. You can see in this chart that we don't have one dominant industry. In fact, many sectors make up the economy. This diversity is an important asset and ensures resiliency, insulating us from economic downturns. While this strong growth in the economy is great, there are also challenges. The Employment Lands and Economy Review has forecasted the need for space to accommodate up to 184,000 additional jobs in Vancouver by 2051. This means we need housing that's matched to the diverse workforce. We know that 172,000 workers commute into Vancouver for jobs with a significant share of commuting by car and contributing to carbon emissions. If we don't provide the needed housing within our city, not only does it compromise equity and climate goals, there are also consequences for employers in their ability to attract and retain workers. Turning to immigration, we know a significant share is coming to Vancouver. We also know that this is expected to increase over time as federal government policies have been increasing immigration targets to drive future growth and create jobs for middle-income Canadians. So with all these factors that are fueling growth in Metro Vancouver, it's not a surprise that, on average, over the past 10 years, Vancouver has the highest number of condominium and rental housing starts in the region. We also have the second highest freehold ownership starts, such as single family development after Surrey. But is that enough? And is that the right type of housing? We've historically had a higher share of renters. Vancouver has 53% rental household compared to 36% in the region. Vancouver's income distribution also exhibits differences with the region. We have a higher proportion of low and moderate income households and fewer high income households. Vancouver and the region are in the midst of an affordability crisis that's very well documented. This chart shows housing costs compared to incomes over the past 10 years in Vancouver and the region. Housing prices in Vancouver have soared over that time period. The benchmark sale price in 2020 for a detached home in East Vancouver was over 80% higher than in 2011, and apartment prices have almost doubled. Many families and, and individuals who could have afforded ownership just 10 years ago are no longer able to do so in Vancouver. And this is a similar trend in the region, as well as other big cities across Canada, like Toronto. This has serious impacts on res residents. We're seeing the share of families declining in the city since 2001. Uh, there are a high number of renters paying more than half of their income on rent. Seniors represent the fastest growing age group with the highest share of renter households in core housing need. 
Indigenous individuals are overrepresented among people experiencing homelessness, making up 33% of the total homeless count in 2020, but only 2.4% of the overall population. With a limited supply of rental housing, new people coming into the city for higher paying jobs may outcompete existing renters in the market, leading to higher rents. So with these trends in mind, We'll be looking at different approaches to growth, especially as it relates to the amount and type of housing we create and how this impacts how we grow, who we grow for, and how we're supporting the economy. We'll be thinking about how many low and moderate income households can stay in the city, how many families leave, how many workers commute in, and what are the land use implications. These questions are important for the type of city we become and will be explored through the next phase of engagement with council and the public in the upcoming months. So thank you, and that concludes the staff presentation. Great, thank you very much, Edna, and thank you, Susan, as well. So we're now going to be um, hearing from our diverse range of experts, and I'll just remind Council that you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of each of the um, panelists at the end of their presentation, at, of all the presentations. Um, so I'd like to first welcome our first panelist, Mary Rowe. Mary is the President and CEO of the Canadian Urban Institute. And Mary, I think you have some slides to share, so please go ahead. Most important thing to know about Mary Rowe is that she's on Eastern and it's dark and <laughs> I'm drinking tea to keep my attention as sharp as it can possibly be uh, to be with uh, you all in Vancouver. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to see some folks that I have met over the last couple of years. I've been in this role for two years. Councillor Swanson, lovely to see you. We sit together on the municipal working group on housing that CUI coordinates with a group called The Shift and others of you. And, and I'm going to apologize in advance, as I always do, to colleagues in the planning department because I've spent most of my professional career disparaging experts and suggesting that uh, planning is important, but it's no substitute for leadership. And so I want to encourage Council to uh, be as informed and as equipped as you can possibly be by the very able staff that you have here, both from, that are giving you regional perspectives and hyperlocal, and the process that Susan just described you're in the midst of and that Edna was giving you some basis for. But I just want to suggest that, that it's going to boil down to choices and priorities in terms of how you imagine uh, what the future needs to be for your city and as much and for your region and as much as experts and as I said I, I sort of uh, feel I'm sort of an AI I, I, people assume I'm a planner I'm not I'm, a, I'm really a non planner in this job go figure but I'm also really a non expert I really feel so strongly that expertise and specialized knowledge has gotten us into a lot of mess and so in fact what we really need is a kind of collective approach to how we actually make decisions, and that's why council is so critically important. So I'm going to give you the sort of uh, furthest perspective, running a national organization, 30 years old, uh, but I often say it's a 30-year startup because really uh, the last 18 months has transformed the way we need to understand cities, the way we need to look at them, and also um, it's an, a moment, what I would suggest, of uh, a reckoning, you know, that we really don't have any more excuses uh, and we don't really have any more ways that we can uh, just keep talking about the ways in which cities have failed and we've got to be really imaginative about harnessing a whole bunch of, of opportunities to uh, reinvent them and, as they have been you know cities of the law are the oldest probably the greatest achievement of human of human nature and they outlive everything they outlive corporations they outlive companies and they are unbelievably resilient and part of our role as stewards of them is to pay attention to the trends that are you're going to be talked to you're going to be exposed to over the next several months as you go through this process and then see how you can attune yourself to really listen as stewards of the future of that place in terms of how it's going to evolve. So all the factors that you would anticipate are the ones that hit Vancouver squarely. Uh, immigration, these challenges now that we can't turn our backs on in terms of equity and diversity, as I suggested, I, don't, I, don't, I think we have to move beyond talk now and we're going to have to really come to terms and reckon uh, with the legacies exclusion that urban planning and design has have actually perpetuated. And even the way we do zoning and the way that we've uh, done land allocation, you know, we have the legacy of that. And you in the West have been on the forefront of reconciliation and what that needs to look like. Now it's time for us to concretize that and really make 
uh, significant changes to the way we actually allowed growth to occur. The other thing is this aging piece, which Edna mentioned. Uh, I've just come from Halifax, uh, where we were there for a week doing a CUI local program, and I'm actually coming to Victoria in a couple weeks, and I'll be in your fair town uh, for a week in October. Um, uh, this is happening across the country, but it's particularly acute in certain places where you're going to have more and more older folk as we continue to live. And what does that mean in terms of how you're going to uh, orchestrate the way in which the people get around and what circumstances they live in? Uh, talent attraction and retention, you know this story because it's made Vancouver. Immigration has made you what you are. And now the question is going to be, how do you actually continue to attract and retain? And then the the thing that is we're squarely being faced with now, and this is true in every urban environment across the country, is what are the strategies, what are the holistic supports that we need to take around mental health that are really going to uh, dramatically alter the way in which the people that are, are unhoused or I struggle with mental health and addictions actually find a place to survive in cities. So um, there's a potential, as I suggested, the visionary planning. And I'm just going to highlight these things that you can see in my slides. Um, I think agility and flexibility are far more important. That's why I always have a problem. My biggest concern is with plan, a plan. I think what you need is a process that allows you to continually plan. And that's what is going to win the day, is to being able to adapt and be flexible. And the form has to be built at the outset to be flexible and agile, whether that's housing or transportation or any of the land uses. We've seen it during COVID, right? We saw how we suddenly were able to repurpose patios. We were able to repurpose public space. We were able to repurpose streets. We were able to repurpose sidewalks. Where I live, our sidewalks here in Toronto have been completely transformed into outdoor patios. It's fantastic. So I hope you're going to look at ambitious leadership, which is what I think your council needs to take the bull by the horns, as they say. Some ambitious zoning stuff to make things more possible as of right, like accessory dwelling units, parking minimums, I know you're already looking at. You're going to have to do investments in public realm and placemaking because we're hopefully going to have more people looking out and realizing they need amenities close to where they are. If we go through anything like this again, where our mobility is constrained for a period of time, every neighborhood has to have public realm and placemaking investments. We can't just have it in certain parts of the city. It's ridiculous. And then the other thing I would encourage you to do is always be looking, and I hope the planners who are on the call will agree with me, that we need tools, mechanisms to allow local differentiation. I do not need, nor do you, to go out your front door and see the same chains and the same kinds of built form that you would see in any other city. For heaven's sake, let's make sure that we're supporting and in engendering all sorts of really fabulous differentiation and local variation and, and businesses that reflect and inter enterprises that reflect the population that's living there and choosing to be there. And let's hope that that means that we're going to think more imaginatively about different kinds of typologies, different kinds of land tenancy, community land trust, mixed use, whatever it's going to take. You've done some interesting stuff already on this. You need to do more. Uh, I'm hoping I'm going to advance my slide. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, the other piece is obviously the economy of this. You know, there is no place, there is no, there is no community without an economy. That is what underwrites why we come together. That's why cities form so we could trade and exchange. And you've again got tremendous assets in this regard, post-secondaries, which need to be harnessed and you need to be in close as close an engagement as you possibly can for them to help solve some of your problems. City Studio is a great example that was incubated in the West and that we're trying to advance across the country. Hackathons happen all over the place. You've got an enormous cognitive surplus in the tech sector. We see it not just in the tech sector. I think it's in tons of retirees who've got bandwidth to be put to work to help us solve some of these challenges. And you're already doing some of this, creating new investment vehicles for Indigenous businesses. We need a whole bunch more of this. Caroline Hilton from Indigenomics is on your doorstep on the island, and you've got a, a perfect example of an extraordinary development um, that the Slave Teeth and other First Nations are doing on the broad uh, uh, peninsula. So I think that's what you call it, but you guys can correct my geography. But it's a fabulous example that I talk about across the country about the Indigenous community actually stepping up and developing housing. Um, and then this notion of ad hoc regional uh, uh, enterprises or entities that don't, you know, in the absence of regional government, although you have one, but that's across the country, this varies. And so I am encouraging us to not get too hung up on what we don't have and to think about, well, how do we get mission focused, problem solving stuff that can actually help us address at the local what the particular needs are. And that may well sp speak to the downtowns in your particular communities or the main streets, however it's configured, but that you start to find ways to not let jurisdictional constraints prevent you from having a holistic kind of collaborative approach. And, you know, some cities have done this, some municipal governments have done this by setting up offices of urban mechanics or innovation hubs. There are models for you, and I'd love to see you guys 
be even more uh, progressive on that and continue to do more and more of that. And then the other area where, again, you have the jump is uh, climate activism has, has been seated there with you for some time. So how can you actually continue to reinforce um, the relationship with the clean tech sector? You know, a lot of the clean tech innovation is, is, is uh, located in your region. Um, are there ways that your zoning could actually enhance that? Could you have some innovation zones or districts that would do that? Uh, this per third piece is a piece that I have to do across the country, which is we need a new deal in this country about how transit is funded and how the decisions are made. It can't, we cannot have such a reliance on the fare box. It's different in British Columbia. I appreciate your partnership with the province, but we probably need the federal government to get involved in operating transit and understand that it's part of how an economy, a national economy, it's an underpinning that we all need to be pursuing. Um, and I know that you're already continuing to look at building code reform, but I just want to encourage you that I think for us to be able to reach climate targets, we're going to need to have targets and explicit goals. The federal government is starting to figure this out, that if they go, if they want to reach their goals, they're going to have to work with municipalities and cities directly. And again, I think you can flex a lot of local muscle in a, establishing and achieving those targets, both in terms of buildings and transportation. And um, in terms of the affordability that Edna was just speaking about, you know, you really are the poster child for that. Uh, it's not, again, unique to you because it's happening now everywhere, but you were early on this. Uh, in my previous uh, role, when I came back from the U.S., I worked in the Premier's office in Ontario. And I was calling your colleagues in the city of Vancouver to talk about foreign buyers tax and what kinds of tools were available to us. So you have been facing this for some time, but I think it's it's no one solution. As you know, there's no one silver bullet here. And uh, my uh, general suggestions are that we've got a defang NIMBY which means I think getting as of right zoning for all sorts of enabling different kinds of opportunities, that that needs to happen across the region so that you don't get into a situation where one part of the city gets it, another part doesn't, and then you start to have these uh, fights. And I'll be interested for council to interact with us about this, to tell us what your struggles are in terms of your own constituencies. And I think that you need cover strategies basically to be bold and creative. And I, I really hope that that your staff can support you in how that could happen so that you can do the right thing uh, and not be um, uh, unable to do so because of the nature of your tenure. Uh, um, I'd love for the design community in this country to be more animated and more engaged. I, I would love someone to tell me why we can't do that. I, I worked in the US for 15 years. The design community understood its obligation to the, to the civic sector, the public realm. And I, I don't know what it would take to get more Canadian designers engaged, but we need them to help us figure out how do we up choice? How do we up choice? How do we up choice in how we get around and how we live, how we function, how we earn livings and how we include people. That's where we need designers, heads, skills to help us. Um, and then the other thing, the other piece of it is that we've got to start working with capital stewards, people that manage a lot of dough. And we have a lot of dough in Canada, a lot. $212 billion sitting in Canadian bank accounts now um, after the pandemic. And, and plus pension funds and all the kinds of aggregate funds, you know, you have some of the more progressive lenders, Van City and others that have been working in the, in, uh, the West and are now moving into other parts of the country. We've got to try to find ways for those financial stewards to imagine how to get, uh, as I've suggested here, locally tethered investment vehicles, ways to get money into local economies. So if you take all that together, the pieces that you're struggling with, sustainability, access to jobs and housing affordability, all of that together with visionary planning that those planners around on this table will support you guys to then show collective leadership. And that's what I'm hoping that I can encourage you to do. And I look forward to the discussion with the other experts or with the experts since I'm not one. Thanks very much. Wonderful, thanks very much, Mary. All right, we'll move uh, quickly along here. Uh, next, we are going to hear from Mark Lee. Mark is a senior economist with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. And Mark, uh, I think you've got some slides here that you're gonna share and please go ahead. All right, uh, well, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, you know, this is a city of housing experts. Uh, all you have to do is go on Twitter to find that out. Um, I, I'm repurposing some slides that I've, I've been doing research more around um, housing affordability across Metro Vancouver, so on a regional basis. So uh, a little bit out of my comfort zone, just breaking it down to the city of Vancouver, but I do live in the city of Vancouver and uh, you know, it's, it's very uh, dear to me. Um, and I kind of did these really late in the day and Allison is gonna forward them uh, for me. We've never worked together, so hopefully it works out okay. All right, next slide. So, you know, well, what do we want? I know, I think, what we want is is more missing middle. Um, you know, we've been um, pretty good at um, you know some incremental change in uh, uh, detached housing neighborhoods, 
Uh, we've been pretty good at building high-rise apartments. Uh, I don't think we've been particularly good, at least not in recent decades, around uh, some of the, the, the missing middle stuff, everything from row houses uh, to, um, you know, uh, I'll let up to essentially multiplexes and small uh, apartments uh, and essentially wanting those to be accessible to a wide range of household incomes uh, and, and types. Uh, so uh, a, a big bang of big missing middle housing, uh, I'd say mostly focused on the, the RS or detached uh, housing zones. Uh, and we want it to be uh, affordable. We want it to be diverse. We want it to be climate friendly. So, uh, you know, we're doing things like having uh, shared walls, building the passive house standards, um, you know, making sure that they are more resilient to things like the heat dome that we uh, confronted earlier this year, uh, but also anchoring those in housing in closer proximity to where people live, work, uh, and play. Uh, and the, the idea of, uh, of complete communities in, uh, in urban uh, planning uh, parlance. Uh, I think a lot of this missing middle could be done on small lots uh, that it could be, you know, ground oriented, um, if we cut out sort of minimum parking requirements, uh, the need for large land assemblies, uh, I'd say maybe you could um, have land assembly up to 100 uh, feet of, of frontage, but maybe even, even less uh, would be the orientation. Uh, and I'd love to see an emphasis on, on non-market uh, and rental and, and using public land uh, to all of those ends. And we should do this all with the objective of reducing the wealth gap and the phenomenal windfall gains that have gone uh, to homeowners over the past uh, few decades uh, in Vancouver. Next slide. So where do we want it? Um, again, this is the looking at Metro Vancouver as a whole. So it's a little bit, uh, bit bird's eye perspective, um, but I think if we want it almost everywhere. Um, you know, there's a lot of parts of the central city and around transit hubs where we are already pretty dense, um, but I would focus on the RS zones uh, of the city uh, the essentially the 80% of land um, where only 35% of households are, are living on that. And we need to, to open that up uh, in, in a big way. So not just uh, more density on uh, noisy main streets, um, but uh, in the leafy residential neighborhoods um, that near schools, parks, uh, community centers, the quiet side streets. Uh, and I would even put Shaughnessy Square uh, into that debate as well. We should definitely densify Shaughnessy. I live two blocks away. I just went for a walk there this afternoon. There's nothing happening in Shaughnessy. Uh, every sixth or seventh house is being uh, rebuilt or reconstructed from one giant mansion into another giant mansion. Uh, so many of those houses are empty. And we're talking about land right in the center of the city that's walking distance to, uh, to downtown, to Broadway. Uh, and all kinds of amenities. So uh, I would put Shaughnessy squarely on the table. Um, I think some of the, the existing built form you see in, in Kitsilano and Mount Pleasant uh, are areas that I think uh, we could emulate across the city uh, in those RS zones. Uh, you know, some of that was built before the current uh, zone, but um, you know, starting with those zoning schedules to work as well. Uh, the area I'm in, which is close to Shaughnessy, but, but not quite as the sort of a um, medium density RM3 zone, in South Granville uh, is also worth contemplating uh, as well. Next slide. So, I mean, here's a very typical uh, street in Vancouver. This is a, a visualization from the urban area uh, missing middle competition. Uh, next slide. And one of the, uh, one of the winners of the, of the competition, um, you know, suggested this kind of, kind of form. So it's still very much in scale with the neighborhood, but at much higher densities, um, you know, limited land assembly, but you know, housing a, a lot more people. Uh, next slide. And th these next couple slides are really just to show that we have tons of examples of this already uh, in the city. So we don't really need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to allow this type of development uh, much more broadly across the city. Next slide. Uh, sorry for the resolution on these, but yeah, these type of developments, um, you know, uh, two buildings on a, on a lot or row housing are, you know, basically come at it about double the existing uh, zone density in the RS uh, neighborhoods. Next slide. Yeah, these ones, you know, at, at slightly larger density, uh, maybe a triple the, the existing density, but, you know, uh, two FSR or floor space ratio. Next slide. 
sorry, like I said, Alison and I haven't worked together before. Um, so, you know, in some of the big picture, you know, things to just to kind of throw the cat among the pigeons, you know, I think what we need is uh, um, ultimately provincial led upzoning. Uh, there's a lot of local obstacles to um, this type of, of development. Um, but I also think that in doing so, we want to, you know, enshrine this principle that that all new development must contribute in some way to uh, affordable housing. Uh, I'm a big fan of expanding non-market uh, and co-op uh, rental housing. Uh, I think the you know, nonprofit developers are, are able to essentially build uh, at uh, at cost. And uh, I've done an, um, some research that basically calculates the the break-even rents that uh, can result. Uh, if you do that, so essentially, you know, you're you're taking out, uh, you know, larger profits going to uh, developers, uh, and and you're making sure that the rents that are achieved, you know, cover the upfront costs of construction. And if you get a contributed uh, land or low cost land, uh, then you can drive those down uh, even further. Uh, on a on a macro scale, um, looking at Metro Vancouver, uh, we've done some of the the math on that, which is that we're looking at about ten thousand new non market rental units per year uh, to keep up with population growth and to alleviate the current uh, imbalance. Uh, and on a micro scale, um, looking at ways of how we can you know, whittle down those costs for for each of those uh, particular pro projects. So uh, building with wood frame, uh, generally up to six stories, uh, waiving parking requirements. Uh, and eliminating um, uh, community many contributions and, and DCLs for, for those, which we're already doing for a lot of, um, of stuff that we want to want to build. But I think we also need some effort to increase the capacity of, of nonprofit developers uh, as well. I'd love to see public land play a, a big role in this. Uh, so I think almost everyone agrees that we should be using uh, existing public land owned by the city or the region or the province or the feds uh, and putting that on the table for uh, developments that build out uh, affordable housing capacity. But I think we should be thinking about a, a pipeline of more uh, public land, especially for that purpose uh, and using uh, progressive property taxation techniques uh, to have the money to be able to purchase that land. A lot of that could be turned over to the nonprofit sector uh, to build out the type of housing uh, uh, that we want. Uh, and I think overall, there's a bigger conversation that's uh, bigger than the conversation here today around uh, re reforms to the property taxation system, uh, more balance between uh, the very preferential treatment that, that uh, homeowners get uh, compared to renters, uh, things like eliminating the homeowner grant, um, you know, I think we should be having more progressive property taxes and, and, uh, and taxation on, on people owning secondary properties. Um, and I also, you know, I think the, the recent Canada BC housing supply report um, challenged the, essentially the, the development system um, where we rely on rezonings and community amenity contributions. Uh, and we should be shifting uh, away from that type of model towards uh, pre-zoning for, for higher density uh, and, and, um, uh, and having certain conditions attached to that. Uh, next slide. Next slide. So what would this kind of look like, you know, sketching this out? I would love this to be the conversation that we have uh, in the election uh, a campaign uh, a year from now. Um, but, you know, on in those RS uh, zones, uh, basically doubling and tripling the existing uh, density that's allowed. So uh, in FSR terms from 0 0.7 to between 1.5 and 2 FSR, uh, that would allow anywhere from 6 to 12 units on a standard lot. Uh, you'd have some potential for assemblies to take advantage of the space in between uh, houses. Um, these would be ground oriented, very uh, uh, efficient into you know, not having a lot of uh, area locked to uh, common areas. Um, and you, it would allow for a lot of, of diversity and potentially you could even go higher density on, on the corners. And you know, some folks are suggesting, uh, you know, up to, to a three FSR on a certain site. So yeah, have this uh, higher density landscape punctuated with some, uh, some higher buildings to, and making it interesting. Um, I think there's a lot of scope for you know, changing the way that these, the zoning schedules are set out. So uh, reducing the front and side setbacks and that way you could get um, uh, the same amount of density with more modest increases uh, in height. Uh, I think there's a lot of scope for architects and builders to just to do uh, some interesting forms, but also, you know, maybe we should be thinking about the, the success of the Vancouver special back uh, in the day, uh, much derided by some, but uh, workforce affordable housing for um, immigrant families uh, for many decades. 
And the idea that we could have pre-approved templates that would essentially uh, be a matter of an over-the-counter approval uh, at City Hall is, is very appealing. And they wouldn't necessarily need to be one template. You could have a whole series of them for standard lots or double lots um, or, or even multi-unit housing. Uh, and of course, minimum parking requirements would be eliminated uh, as well. Um, next slide. So the conditions on that, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, I'm, my concern is that if you just open this up, then uh, developers are going to build to what the market will bear. And that is unaffordable for the vast uh, majority of, of, of folks. Um, I was you know, recently in the housing market myself, and there's very um, limited options or the options you have are, are constrained to smaller units on, on very busy streets. Um, I'd love to see uh, you know, if we are going to have um, market strata development, that a proportion of those units have to go into some sort of permanently affordable uh, state, um, or they would have to pay some, um, instead of a community amenity contribution, I'm calling it sort of a housing affordability contribution or something along those lines. Um, and exactly how that, how much that should be is, is up for grabs, but uh, architect Bryn Davidson was suggesting like about $400 uh, per square foot. Um, and, you know, essentially, if you do the math, you know, you can, you can make that pencil out for uh, a lot of uh, places, unless you get into really high uh, land costs. But I think imposing that also would uh, constrain the potential for uh, property or land values to, uh, to increase in response to, to the upzoning. Uh, and the, the flip side of that is that, um, you know, we, we would want to de-incentivize the conversion of uh, existing single family housing into new single family housing, which is sort of what we're seeing in Shaughnessy uh, up the street. So you would down zone that so they, they would have um, uh, less capacity to do that. Next slide. I'm almost done. So Mark, yeah, I just want to let you know, we're just at the 12 minute mark here. So if you could uh, maybe just bring it to a conclusion to make sure we have a chance for the other panelists. I know we're Sorry, trying to- Sorry, this is season. my last slide. So oh. essentially what would this look like? I mean, you could have a, a market strata development with an affordable housing contribution. So either they're building in kind or in cash contributing to affordable housing. Uh, the idea of like uh, aging in place, um, uh, seniors uh, who have a property uh, who may want to stay on that property could redevelop um, um, their their property or multi generational housing so that there's more capacity. Um, potentially partnering with a nonprofit, I think that's an interesting model for for uh, building up uh, the detached housing neighborhoods. Um, and market rental, uh, of course, and then um, a non market and co op uh, rentals. Um, you know, and if we get uh, contributed land, then you know, the potential for like much, much lower than market rents uh, is possible. And um, I'll leave it there and look forward to the discussion. Thanks so much for having me here. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. All right. We'll uh, move swiftly on to our next panelist. And this is John Rose. John is an instructor with the Department of Geography and the Environment at Kotlin Polytechnic University. And John, I think you have some slides to share as well. So we'll just get you loaded up there. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we should be good, I hope. Yes, please go ahead. Great. Um, so Vancouver 2050, an expert discussion on planning and growth. Lots to discuss. Thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm gonna focus on planning for housing provision and on the city's shift, especially since the 2017 Housing Vancouver Strategy and continued here in the Vancouver Plan to a more expansive assessment of housing need and a more prescriptive approach to addressing that need via target setting for new housing development. So as you can see here, there are three parts to this presentation and slideshow, housing need, housing targets, and housing supply. I think with five minutes, I'm just gonna be able to address one aspect here, uh, housing need, uh, and the role of unmet demand in the assessment of this. But I welcome questions from council, staff, and other panelists about the other two parts of the slideshow, a closer examination of how unmet demand is estimated and turned into targets, slides four and five, and thank you in advance, by the way, to the uh, planning department for their understanding uh, in my inclusion of a slide uh, that includes uh, a chart from uh, a stakeholder meeting of which I was a participant. Um, and so I have some things to say about that. And finally, if um, the other part of the slideshow, if you have questions about this, uh, questions about how the targets may be met by supply covered in slide six, um, I'd be happy to address those. If we don't have time for this, I understand, and I'll be following up shortly in any event with a written report. 
So as part of uh, today's session, um, at least in terms of the preparatory or accompanying documents, we'll see in this chart prepared by the planning department that provides an estimate of housing need for the city of Vancouver between 2022 and 2031. So one component is pretty straightforward, housing need, although maybe Andrew later will be complicating this, uh, housing need generated by the estimated uh, net growth of new households as a result of external drivers uh, that Sean, I think, covered quite well earlier, uh, in migration, internal drivers like new household formation from in adults. And so we arrive at about 35,000, uh, although it looks more like 40 on this particular chart. And conventionally, this is what you would plan for in a kind of responsive fashion. You'd want to ensure that the land base can accommodate new households uh, and dwelling units. You'd plan, as Sean described, to direct the settlement. Uh, as with, you know, the Metro Vancouver regional planning documents that discuss these figures as estimates and targets, and which identify areas where such growth is to be directed. Now, the other component here is more intriguing and serves to expand the assessment of housing need. Those already living in the region, but whose housing needs are partially or wholly unmet in terms of affordability, state of repair, number of bedroom, bedrooms, etc. So we see here that the unmet demand component is approximately 46,000 households. And by my rough calculations, about 66,000 individuals, almost 10% of the city's residents. So this is the largest component of the housing need category. And you put these things together and you get a total housing needs assessment of about 81,000 households for the 2022 to 2031 period. Of course, this needs assessment then informs the city's targets for housing and more specific management of housing supply. But in all of this number tallying and chart making, I think it's vital to ask the question, why is there all of this unmet demand? I've circled an area of the chart, um, which represents roughly, I mean, in a few months time, the present day. And not to quibble too much with the chart makers here, I don't wanna be, um, you know, sort of, uh, nitpicky here, but, you know, really, this is where we should see that 46,000, you know, um, households of unmet demand, in addition to, you know, what would be on an annualized basis, about three and a half thousand uh, units or households of estimated annual new demand. But here's the question, right? Um, there's an assumption here, I think, that, you know, we have this 46,000 uh, households whose housing needs are not fully met. And I think, you know, we see that figure uh, to stay the same at the end of 2031. And the question is, will the next 10 years see a reduction in this unmet demand to zero? Will the policy interventions be successful? So we just have 46,000 total for this entire period, or is there only gonna be a partial reduction? Uh, stay the same or perhaps even increase. So this unmet demand is a main component to the housing need category, the basis uh, of target setting and planning for housing supply. So I might ask, don't we need to figure out the causal factors behind unmet demand to figure out whether or not policies will address these and what the future may hold? So let's consider those explanations uh, focused on the role of housing provision in kind of creating unmet demand, given that the focus of targets is housing provision, uh, not income growth or other kinds of things over the next 10 year span. So we see here, you know, one component um, is the, you know, insufficient provision of suitable, affordable non-market housing, and we've heard Mark refer to that. So perhaps we'll have some further conversation later in the round table. Um, though obviously it's of importance and also connected to the next component, which is the insufficient provision of suitable, affordable market housing. So why is that the case? I think this is an essential question that we need to answer uh, in this process of target setting. And I'm just gonna stay to slide three here. So I know I'm past five minutes, but I'll keep it short. Um, we see changes in housing costs and, you know, as um, you know, Edna showed earlier, uh, Ms. Cho, we saw here this, this chart and we might ask ourselves how that's correlated with the changes in, in the factors affecting demand for housing. And those correlations are pretty easy to pull out, whether we look at incomes or purchasing power, uh, maybe a little harder to enumerate to the last nth degree, but nevertheless important to individual and institutional investors. There's a clear kind of connection, right? A correlation. Uh, but we also hear these explanations that are focused on the supply side. We hear the term inelastic supply. 
you know, suppliers are willing to supply lots of housing only in response to very high prices and comparatively little housing in response to small prices, price, price increases. There's a huge gap in this explanation, uh, which is often then attributed to the factor of governmental regulation. And so we really need to get at the heart of this to see to what extent uh, is you know, governmental regulation, for example, in the form of zoned or development capacity uh, behind uh, this inelastic supply situation. Um, I'm happy then to address uh, perhaps in the course of councillor questions or in the course of the round table, um, other aspects of this presentation, uh, target setting and how those targets are gonna be met by supply um, in addition to this. But I see I'm at about seven minutes so I'll uh, stop there and thank you very much and look forward to a fulsome discussion today and further elaboration in written form of these ideas. Great. Thank you so much, John, for staying with your time there. Um, and I'd like to welcome our next panelist. Our next panelist is Andrew Ranlo, is the Vice President of Advisory Services with Rennie Group. Thank you so much, Diana. Give me two seconds here and I'll get into my slideshow. All right, thank you so much uh, to planning staff as well as mayor and council for uh, asking me to participate tonight. Um, Sean covered some of the how many with respect to current outlooks for the region uh, as per Metro 2050. And we thought that it would be valuable to look at some of the whys and hows behind the how many. So that's uh, sort of the role that I'm gonna play in the next five minutes. But before I get into that, uh, I'd like to build on something that, uh, that Mary said, or a word that Mary brought up, and that's aging. Um, it's important not to lose sight of the importance of demographic change in all of these discussions about looking forward into the future. Nobody really likes to admit that, they, uh, that they're getting older or that they have a birthday coming up, but we are entering what's being called Canada's silver century as the bulk of the post-World War II boom ages into the retirement stage of the life cycle. And it's the changes in the collective needs and wants of, let's say, the region's 3 million residents or the city of Vancouver, 697,000 residents that, to some degree, are going to have a much larger impact on how our region and the city functions than the additions of population that, uh, that we're going to see within the next year or with even it within the next 10 years. So I'm actually going to advocate that we, in terms of a, a name for this particular section, that it's not the city of Vancouver's planning for growth, it's actually planning for growth and change. Uh, we do really, really need to recognize the base population that's, that is here already and how that's gonna change in, uh, in the coming decades. So uh, there you go, there's a, so something that I thought about. Um, in terms of looking at some of the hows and whys uh, behind the how many, uh, for this I need to jump up to the national level and all the way back to 1971. And that was the point at which the post-World War II boom started to uh, enter uh, the labor force in large part in, in Canada. And that, at that particular time, there was about 6.6 .6 people of working age, so aged 15 to 64, uh, per senior citizen. We go ahead two decades, and that number of workers per senior had declined by about 20% down to about 5.3%. 2020, it had declined about another 36% down to only about 3.4 workers per senior citizen. And the projections were under the historical immigration targets at the national level of about 250,000. That, that number would fall further, but another 30% uh, down to about 2.3 workers per senior citizen. Now, within the context of a slowly growing labor force as a result of this big demographic shift and the potential implications that it had for a growing and robust economy, as well as financing things like social services with respect to the healthcare system or the candidate pension plan, uh, the federal government in 2017 came around and decided to increase our federal immigration targets from that range of about 250,000 up to 310,000 in 2018, 340,000 by 2020. And then in 2018, they came back to the table and said, well, we're gonna go a little bit further and a little bit higher. We'll go to 2021 and 350,000. And well, then COVID happened. And by the end of 2020, we actually only welcomed about 184,000 new permanent residents to Canada. And that was our lowest level since uh, 1998. It was about 156,000 short relative to the targets that, uh, that the federal government had set. 
So then we jump ahead to October of last year and there were new targets established at the, at the federal level. And this was to achieve about 400,000 immigrants in 2021, 411,000 in 2022, and then way up to 421 by uh, 2023. So if you work the math on all of that, what the federal government is trying to do here is basically just make up for the number uh, that was lost uh, relative to their targets as a result of COVID. So that's the big driver behind what uh, the new immigration plan was for 2021 to 23. So what does it look like in absolute numbers? There's the, the immigration line. So this is immigration on the top, uh, immigration on the bottom and natural increase, which is just the difference between births and deaths each year. And that's what the targets look like up to that 421. And our models, we expect it to go back down to about 0.85 historical, short-term historical average, uh, which would bring in about 360,000 immigrants over that longer term out to 2041. So even with these well, relatively robust levels of immigration, you'll notice that black line, that's natural increase, actually becomes natural decrease by about 2036, which again shows the very significant aging of the Canadian population. It's at that point that the number of deaths in a particular year would outweigh the number of births uh, and become negative, and the only uh, net growth in the Canadian population would be as a result of, of net migration or net immigration from the, the national level. Here's what it looks like in terms of absolute number, 38 million, uh, certainly increasing uh, in terms of absolute number. We're looking at adding in about 7.2 million over the next two decades or so. It seems like a big number in a historical context. If I look back over the past two decades, uh, it's not quite as much as what we added nationally. It's about 7.7 .7 million over the last uh, two decades. So a period of a little bit slower growth, but not too much. So the big question comes out then, well, what are the implications for BC and the Lower Mainland? There's an infographic of about 700, 275,000 immigrants per year, which we've seen on average over the last decade. And there's what BC's share looks like. We pick up about 15% of them. It's about 40,000 annually. And the interesting thing here is we only have about 13% of Canada's population. So we kind of punch a little bit above our weight with respect to our share of, of immigrants coming to British Columbia. So we also punch a little bit above our weight with respect to the composition of interprovincial migrants as well. How about the Lower Mainland? Well, in my context here, I'm a little bit broader than what Sean's looking at. I include the Fraser Valley as well as Squamish in what I would call my functional region here. And that Lower Mainland region of the BC bound immigrants, we pick up about 90% of them, 36,000 a year on average, but we only have about 60% of the, of the regional, of the provincial population. So any of these policy changes at the federal level have a very significant impact here in the province as well as here in, in the Lower Mainland. Here's what the Lower Mainland forecast looks like. 311, 3.1 million uh, in terms of net additions, our uh, forecast is about 927,000 over the next two decades or so. Uh, again, for some context, the past two decades was about 825. So we're also a, a, a punch above our weight in the lower mainland here with respect to our share of interprovincial migration. We get anywhere from 45 to about 60% of, uh, of the interprovincial migration, depending on the year. And the result is that the next two decades in terms of our outlook for the region is, uh, is above what our past two decades was in terms of accommodating additional population. And I just should note as well that our, my population uh, forecasts align very well with, uh, uh, with the metro projections, which are just a little bit of a smaller level of geography. And I worked with uh, Sean's technical crew in terms of development of the, of the regional projections as well. So how about housing future residents? These are some of the issues that, uh, that John certainly uh, started to, uh, to, to jump into. There's our population growth. We take a demographic approach to this and look at age specific household formation rates and in applying those to the population, we need to add about 446, 450,000 net new units to the region uh, over the coming two decades. So from again, a context side of things, that's like adding another city of Vancouver plus Burnaby plus New Westminster and Richmond uh, within about the next two decades. So very, very significant in terms of the housing additions. Why does this matter? Well, we all know that most communities in the province are already exp experiencing issues of both availability and affordability. And this situation is only gonna persist if housing supply doesn't exceed expected demand from population growth and change. 
with that being said, the region's also expected to accommodate oh, about 570,000 net new jobs, all within a relatively limited land base. So some very significant challenges on, on the land side as well. But we also have another tie in here as well. There is a fundamental link between a robust housing stock of available and affordable housing and our ability to attract and retain workers uh, that's gonna allow us to grow and diversify the region's economic base. So some interesting aspects there as we certainly boil down to the citywide level as well. Cities played a very, very important role in shaping the region's economic and demographic landscape to this point in time. And it's through things like uh, the city's uh, housing targets, the 10-year housing targets, as well as the longer-term dance plan that uh, we'll be able to contribute into shaping the coming years uh, in terms of going forward and what the region looks like. So with that, I'm going to say thank you, and I look forward to uh, the questions as uh, we get into that part of the discussion. Well, thanks very much, Andrew. All right, and our final panelist this evening is Dr. Julia Harton. She's an assistant professor at the School of Community and Regional Planning at UBC. So Julia, please go ahead. And I think you have some slides to share as well. Yes, let me just pull up my slides. And uh, in, the in the meantime, thank, thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. Can everyone see the slides? Good. OK, great. So um, I thought I would uh, take a, a step back and um, provide some more basic um, or perhaps fundamental lessons from the literature and the recent research about how growth and planning for growth and housing um, interrelate. And um, I think the other panelists have, uh, and, and as well as Sean Cotterway, have made a good point of, of convincing you that that growth is likely going to happen jobs are going to be created in in vancouver and in the in the region in the coming years and another reason perhaps to be confident that this growth really is coming uh is from the literature because if you um look at the uh, the industries that are driving growth the industries that are going to add jobs to vancouver all of those are knowledge and service-based industries businesses that are um, disproportionately density um, dependent and uh, who are going to demand urban space when it access or an urban labor force. And I can talk about that more in the questions if needed. Um, Having said that, having said that there is compelling evidence that growth is going to come, uh, I want to make three points um, to just keep in mind as we think about planning for this growth. So the first one is to uh, remind everyone to think about time along with equity when thinking about planning for growth. So one of the fundamental lessons of studying urban land markets is that when cities grow, demand for urban urban space goes up, and with that increased demand, land values generally grow up. Um, and if that space is scarce, meaning that there's more supply, uh, more demand, excuse me, than supply, then th that even further adds fuel to this um, growth in land values. And the second fundamental lesson then is that those that have bought into bought land um, earlier on in that growth trajectory are gonna be able to profit more from it. So uh, again, other panelists have made that point, but just to stress that those that have bought property when land prices were lower, when demand was lower at the perhaps earlier stages of the growth trajectory that Vancouver has been on, um, they are now sitting on land that is just becoming more and more valuable with time. And newcomers, on the other hand, um, uh, can never catch up to that for once, but they're also in ex increasingly excluded from um, benefiting in that growth, right, from ac accessing um, home ownership. And so because of how land markets work in our current system and the system that we're operating, this fundamental inequity between um, earlier and newer and future um, residents of Vancouver is almost built into the, uh, in the system. And the key to addressing that, uh, the literature and research tells us, is to um, consider to tackle scarcity, to tackle this element of scarcity that is a further amplifier of prices amidst high demand. Um, and and uh, ways to address that scarcity, again, other panels have made the point, is to increase what can be built, to increase zoning, to allow for, for building up, basically. In, in, creating more accessible, valuable urban space by increasing how 
each location is used, how intensely it is used, but also by um, uh, increasing accessibility, by creating connectivity, and by investing in uh, transportation infrastructure. Um, in either case, the, the point to take away is that the earlier we plan for this growth, the better, because the longer we wait, the longer we play into this scarcity factor. And the more we we contributed to that inequity between earlier, newer, and future residents of Vancouver. The second point I want to make is that um, you know, knowing that that jobs are coming, jobs are going to be added to Vancouver, created in Vancouver, people are going to come to. So just to make the point that even if, if we don't plan for housing to accommodate that growth, people are still likely going to come. And I just want to show here quickly an image from my uh, dissertation research, um, which I did in Shanghai. So a little bit of a different context, but I think the lesson still holds. So um, for those of you that are not familiar, this is kind of a typical um, residential neighborhood in, in downtown Shanghai that you would find almost anywhere. And doing my dissertation field work, I found out that a lot of these spaces, you know, from the outside formal spaces, um, actually house many, many more people than what is what is allowed there. And so, you know, this is perhaps an extreme, but one example of how people are going to make it work. I found out through ethnographic work, and I can talk about that more, that a lot of these, um, these people are, are coming in this case, Shanghai, but were coming to Shanghai, Shanghai to take jobs and they were willing to make it work even with incredibly unaffordable housing, very low starting salaries. Um, and, and, and they found ways to, within the formal built environment, make it work for them. Um, so all that to say that if we don't plan for housing, but we know that growth is coming, this will not necessarily lead to less people coming. Um, it may lead to some people not coming to Vancouver, some people choosing not to come, and those are, but those are typically going to be the ones that already have a lot of options. So high income, highly educated individuals may, may choose not to come. Um, but, but especially for lower income residents and lower income uh, individuals um, with fewer choice sets, not building the additional housing that is needed will likely push them into considering subpar and in some parts even unsafe housing um, situations to be able to stay and participate in the, the economic growth of the city. And so if you look at the percentage um, of households, especially lower income households that pay almost or over 50% of their income on rent, we already see that we are on that trajectory with people making sacrifices um, in order to stay in Vancouver and participate in that economic growth. And finally, um, I wanna make a point about uh, renters and data. So in the, the staff presentation and the material that we've all had available for the meeting today, uh, we, read, we, we read that the majority of residents in Vancouver already today are renters. Um, and with home ownership and land prices rising, home, home ownership is becoming um, uh, you know, increasingly inaccessible. And so the importance of renting is only going to increase over time. Um, at the same time, we know very little about the rental housing market. Um, so there's currently no good data to understand the secondary market, so the market for tenure conversions, um, such as single family rented housing or condominium housing, um, which in Vancouver make up for over half of the rental housing stock. Um, the only systematic data collection is really on purpose built rentals. And so we know that the secondary market is a big part of the rental housing market, and we don't know very much about it. We know that both renting is going to increase, but what makes it worse really is that low income and vulnerable households are also disproportionately uh, represented among renters, disproportionately more likely to be, render, to be renters. So this is really a big data gap right now um, that we're working uh, in, the, in academia to, to close um, to really understand the rental market better, to understand how and it does or does not serve, especially lower income individuals. And so I'll just leave you with a final note um, that ties those two things 
together that I mentioned today, which is um, when we make plans, we we choose whose futures matter. And so I just encourage you con to consider the needs of, of earlier and newer and future residents, as well as low income individuals and renter populations. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Julia. And thank you really to all of our panelists. Uh, you've given us a lot to contemplate and I'm sure the councillors have many questions for you all. Um, so I'll now hand the meeting back over to Deputy Mayor Bly, who's going to uh, take care of the questions and answers with the panelists. Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate that and great to hear from uh, all of our panelists today. So this is the portion of the meeting where councillors are able to go on the queue to ask questions of the panelists. And just to remind you, we're going to have one round of questions at five minutes and um, just ensuring that we give our panelists enough time to really fully respond to each question that's posed. <clears throat> so I'll refer to our typical queue and uh, Councillor Hardwick, I see you're first on the queue. So you may go ahead for five minutes. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, the purpose of this event was to focus on data and uh, my frustration, I have to confess, in listening to each of the presentations was the inconsistencies of the data sets that we have been looking at. And so um, I'd like to start with, I guess, it, I think it was um, looking at the regional growth strategy attributions to the subregions and um, the concern, again, the current status of the regional growth strategy is, of course, the latest manifestation going back to the Livable Region Strategic Plan starting in 1973. And over that time, there has been uh, projections that uh, are at a granular level. And in fact, the last ones that were done in, in 2016 in the 2016 to 2026 period showed an attribution of household growth in the city of Vancouver proper of 32,000 households. In contrast, what we're seeing now is we've, we, we can't do an apples to apples comparison because we've moved things up to the sub-regional level. So what I would like to hear from the Metro Vancouver person that, that talked about uh, the projections and the process for the sub-region is uh, what can be done to align this so that we can do a, a longitudinal analysis over multiple periods of time so we can get a more accurate picture of the attribution to the city of Vancouver proper. So that question is directed to Sean Galloway from Metro, I believe. Is that correct, Councilor Hardy? That's, that's the starting. And, and I'm presuming we're gonna have opportunities for uh, multiple uh, questions over of council over time. We're not just limited to one set of questions. As I've mentioned twice already, we are going to limit to one five minute round of question per counselor for that reason. So okay, um, quickly, why can we get the data that aligns with the, the city proper, not just the sub region? Uh, thank you through the through the chair. I hope you can hear me uh, through the chair. Um, we do have that uh, data, which is a core service uh, we provide and we'll be releasing that in, in the next uh, couple weeks. Each municipality has in some way um, asked for it and we are we will be working with uh, City of Vancouver staff to uh, provide that. But uh, again, the city level data will not, uh, at this time is proposed not to be in the regional growth strategy for a variety of reasons, one of being which is hard to amend the regional growth strategy so the data becomes somewhat stale. Um, okay. And uh, that, uh, thank you. So just pointing out that the Housing Vancouver targets are more than double the regional growth strategy attribution to the city over the same decade period. Um, I'd like to go to John Rose in the interest of time. Uh, what's your assessment of the housing needs estimate from 2020, 2022 to 2031 as uh, presented by staff? Great. So thank you. That was kind of the second part of the presentation, which unfortunately I didn't have much time to even get into. I'm going to share, if you don't mind, uh, the slides from that portion of the presentation to um, maybe illuminate kind of what I'm addressing here. So I'll skip to the next slide here. So in the backgrounder to the um, to today's session, you know, uh, staff provided us with this sort of updated housing needs assessment. 
You'll recall that the first chart I referred to had about 81,200 households in total. Um, and I just was interested here to see that we actually dropped down to 73,200. So we have 8,000 fewer than the 81,200 housing needs assessment. Unchanged is the projected 10 year growth in renter and owner households of 35,000, which um, I know Andrew has probably sort of suggested some questions about, um, but we see it here uh, being basically where it is and where people have in, in discussions in council kind of thought it would be. My interest is in really the sort of unmet demand component described here as existing needs. So we see homelessness, uh, 3,200 individuals, uh, SRO replacement, 7,000 singles units, and renter and owner households overpaying on housing at 28,000, uh, which then collectively you know, make up more than half of these targets for the next you know, 10 year period. Now, I appreciate it, as I mentioned, uh, staff's sort of latitude in allowing me to share with you um, some earlier draft uh, work on describing targets. I was a member of this workshop back in May 2021. John, we're just and, at the five minute mark, so if you can wrap up your response. Sure, uh, I'll follow up with the written report, but there are discrepancies here uh, in terms of the figures. And I know it's kind of an iterative process, you know, this is you know, well-intentioned individuals trying to get a handle on this. But I just want to emphasize that the kind of inconsistencies do raise questions about the nature of these numbers, whether they're evidence-based or aspiration-based. Okay. Uh, and, you know, a skeptical oh, member of the public might say, you've got 81,200, and that's your number, and now you're kind of backfilling the okay. justification for it. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. I apologize for the time. I guess that's I should no have done 12 minutes yeah, to begin no with. No problem. And, um, Thanks very much. And there is going to be an opportunity. The panel is going to have a roundtable. They'll be listening to the tone of questions that councils will be asking and can respond in that discussion as well. So, um, or listen to the content, not the tone, the, co the content of questions from councillors. So, I'll go next over to Councillor Swanson for five minutes. Go ahead, please, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, I've got two specific questions and, and one uh, huge concern about homelessness, which hopefully you can address when you do your discussion amongst yourself. So the first question I wanted to ask uh, John Rose, um, and the second one I wanna ask Mark Lee. So the first one is, do you think that adding more expensive rental will reduce prices over time? And for Mark, I wanted to ask, uh, what do you think the role of vacancy control could be in achieving more affordability. I'll be, uh, thank you, Councillor Swanson. I'll be very quick. Um, I am skeptical about these kinds of sort of trickle down models of housing provision, which suggests that if you supply expensive uh, units, that this is some sort of knock on effect uh, that produces um, less expensive supply elsewhere. I would advocate to, to address um, the issues here we need affordable we need housing provision across all affordability bands and we need it now okay thanks uh, thanks, for, thanks for the question yeah. councillor um yeah i'm a fan of vacancy control uh, i think the the lack of vacancy control is is a, a loophole in the in the current uh, rental market and the rent control systems we have so uh you know even as we've had ostensibly you know frozen or very, um, you know, nominal rent increases. And uh, what we've seen overall on average is rents have gone up largely because of the turnover. And then by virtue of having a gap between market rents and prevailing rents, it creates incentives for landlords uh, to be able to evict um, uh, renters uh, and, and increase a rate. So uh, I think, you know, you can make the case for new investment in rental housing that is vacancy controlled. Uh, there's a you know rate of return. It's the flow of rental income that flows back to the uh, the initial developer over time, uh, and that should be sufficient. They shouldn't be relying on windfall profits uh, by virtue of holding that land. Okay. Since I've got three minutes left, then I'll ask. Thanks, Mark. Um, what would you guys do about ending home? How would you guys end homelessness? Does anyone have any good things to do off the top here? I once asked that question to you, Jean, and you said the, the, the reason people are homeless is because they have no homes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the right answer. <laughs> we need to build homes. 
Yeah. So you said, Mark, we need 10,000 units a year. That would cost about $5 billion. So um, do you have any idea? I mean, you had some ideas, progressive property tax, getting rid of the homeowners grant. Do you have some other ideas as to where the rest of the dough could come from? Um, yeah, I mean, I've done a, a paper on like cr crunching out the numbers on that one. I can't remember the exact total of that was. Um, but I think, you know, the, the we have huge uh, windfall gains that have gone to existing landowners uh, in the city. I myself have benefited from those uh, immensely. Uh, and a lot of people are sitting on, on gains that will never be taxed under the current um, system uh, in terms of income tax or capital gains. Uh, and I think that's the tax base, you know, we need to, to go on. So that's why I think, you know, moving to more progressive property tax and regimes so that we ha have more brackets. We're already doing this provincially with the school tax, but it'd be great if the municipality could have similar powers to do that, that type of, of taxation. Eliminating the homeowner grant, that's almost $900 million per year province-wide uh, that goes to homeowners by virtue of owning a home. The province has talked about leveling the playing field with a renter um, a supplement, or, or, or I forget what they're calling it, the renter's rebate. Um, but we have yet to see any action on that from the province. Okay, that's great. Thanks a lot, you guys. Councillor Swanson, can I just jump in for two seconds there? I think it's also important to, to, I don't have any solutions per se, but I also think it's important to recognize that this just, homelessness isn't just a city of Vancouver issue as well. It needs to certainly be looked at regionally and to the degree that uh, we can partner with our surrounding municipalities to try and, and tackle the issue, I think we'll all be better served as well. Yeah, I think it's a national issue. <laughs> I, I totally agree, yeah. So let's not lose sight of uh, getting all the other municipal partners together to help try and solve it. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Swanson. Councillor Carr. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. Um, uh, so I have one general question to start with. Um, I think all of you talked about the fact that we need more rental housing, worker housing, housing for newcomers, all needs to be affordable. But developers over the last decade have certainly built more high-end market condos than anything else, for which the city has got DCLs and CACs, which we use to provide affordable housing, childcare, community centers, parks, et cetera. It's a big conundrum. How do we get our way out of that? Um, I'll jump in. I mean, I, I'd like to see a, a lot more upfront public investment uh, in uh, affordable housing. Um, it's really just the upfront capital cost that needs to be overcome because once you build something, you have a flow of rental income that goes 50, 70, 100 years into the future. So this housing basically pays for itself. If you do it as a public or non profit model, uh, you can get break even rents that are much lower. Again, also, if you're waiving minimum parking requirements, because it's very expensive to dig large holes in the ground, uh, waiving uh, DCLs and, and CACs for those uh, type of projects, uh, and if you have contributed land. So I did some of the math on this um, recently, and you could get, you know, basically, you know, on a, on a nonprofit uh, with a 50 year mortgage, uh, you know, the, the cost of a one bedroom, it could be as low as uh, $1,273 per month. Uh, that's still not cheap uh, for some, uh, but you could use that as an average and uh, across a whole development, you could do some cross subsidies so that a number of the units, uh, say a third of the units could be closer to market rate uh, and a third of the units could be at something like, you know, at much lower, you know, seven to eight hundred dollars uh, per month. So for the very, very poorest, there's still going to need to be some kind of additional uh, income or rent supplement subsidy. Um, but if we do uh, like a public not-for-profit um, you know, model in terms of the build-out that we need and do it at scale, um, we can deliver affordable housing. The economics do actually work. And, does that, uh, and Mark, would that work with the city supplying the money? And if we don't have as many CACs, but, or you saying use the CACs um, in that regard or borrow um, in, in order to build that housing and recoup to the rental, is that the model? Yeah, and I'm not sure because of the, the particular regulations on borrowing municipally, I don't want to over overstate that, but borrowing is one option. Um, but um, yeah, a higher property tax is another option. Oh, I know you did mention that. Thanks. Um, okay, I have a second, I have another question from Mary Rowe. Um, Mary, um, you talked about uh, 
defanging NIMBY, enabling good density everywhere and engaging the design community to provide choice, choice, choice. So I want to know what you think is good density and what do you think about not just engaging the design community, but residents or neighborhoods in the discussion of more choice, choice, choice? Yep, thank you. Thanks, Councillor, um, Deputy Mayor, rather. Uh, can I just come in on what Mark said, uh, too, before I answer the question you just asked, which is that I think we need to look at um, uh, governments getting back into owning some housing. Uh, this is, I see some people nodding. This is not something around which uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm. People are just, you know, they have horrible pictures, dystopian pictures of government buildings, you know, falling apart. But, you know, this is a federal government that is ambitious about housing and maybe, you know, 50 years ago, it did initially, it did initially put the upfront and it held the property. And I think we need to open our minds, not just to government zoning, but to try and create conditions so that there can be a whole range, diverse range of owners of housing units and multiple units. And, and we should make that available more co-ops, more not-for-profits, churches, good heavens, there's faith institutions, but also that, that the federal government might consider going back into that business. I know that's highly controversial, but good God, we haven't had much success with them not being, so maybe we should try it. Now, in answer to your question about good density, well, you know, um, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, across the country, people started to start to ring a bell and say, gee, there you go, density is bad, density is dangerous, um, multi-generational living, congregate living is not healthy. And I think the caveat that I'm trying to add here is that we need to be planning around, and my planning colleagues I'm sure will agree with me, there are amenities and different, there are ways to do density that can be safer, more resilient, but also just in, uh, more livable. And that means public realm investments, and it means interior design changes. It means uh, uh, trying to create, I mean, designers are smart. They can create interiors, just like we're advocating, for instance, that office design is going to need to change and we need more residential to come into commercial spaces. That's going to require a transformation of how those spaces are organized. So are good, good density. Go ahead. Let's see the five minutes for uh, Councilor Carr. I'm sorry to cut you off there. Thank you very much um, for those comments. Uh, Councilor Fry. Oh, wow. These five minutes are going to go fast. Okay, I'm going to go fast. A uh, question for Sean uh, with Metro and the regional growth strategy. Um, you know, in, in recent uh, year, we've seen um, the feds invest in, in new SkyTrain for Surrey and Langley, which is an area of uh, untapped growth and potential for a lot of density. How does this change our regional context growth strategy? Or does it? So, uh, thank you through the chair. Um, certainly, a lot the growth that's uh, occurring out there and those types of investments uh, are being, that's part of when we go out to engage at the local level, we understand some of those larger larger investments that are occurring and we're partnering with TransLink uh, in, in, in terms of their transportation strategy and aligning our projections with uh, those investments going out there. So some, most of that is baked into the current projections that you see forthcoming. Okay, so we're not anticipating a rethink for for the no. Burrard Peninsula relative to the new growth south of the Fraser? No. Okay, thanks. Um, moving on then, a question for Mark. Uh, Mark, you, you mentioned a lot about um, provincial led up zoning and uh, uh, both eliminating DCLs and uh, CACs um, at a time when, when we as local governments are experiencing a lot more provincial downloading and increased costs. I'm curious why you hadn't explored some of the different tools, like rather than say up zoning, actually down zoning with the new provincial rental only zoning um, legislation that provides us an opportunity to effectively down zone land for housing that we need. Um, yeah, I, th I think the, you know, the gist of the comment was, uh, you know, if you go to the, um, the BC Canada um, Housing Supply and Affordability Panel, probably getting that name slightly wrong, but um, I think, you know, they really nailed it well when they, they argued that the current uh, development system, like the way we introduce density uh, it is broken uh, because it's all, you know, site by site uh, spot rezonings um, with a negotiated or in some cases targeted um, community amenity contributions. Uh, and we've become reliant uh, on that model. Now, 
the model works well for some larger, uh, bigger, um, you know, market builds, uh, and you can shoehorn a little bit of affordability uh, onto that um, model as a result. But I think it, it you know, really changing the game uh, is is what we want to want to do. And particularly if as we as we kind of have built out a lot of the industrial areas, the transit hubs, and now we're on high streets, we're looking at expanding that density into the detached housing uh, neighborhoods. And, you know, I, I say this without recognizing the political challenges of, of, of making those uh, uh, those type of positions. Um, but nonetheless, I think that's that's where we need to go. Uh, and so re reframing that model away from rezoning and CUCs towards uh, pre-zoning or upzoning uh, and, and allowing certain types of, of development uh, with particular conditions attached that ensure we build affordable housing along the way. Okay, so if local governments are taking on the burden of affordable housing, which is really a provincial kind of responsibility, how do we finance our infrastructure and, and other aspects of livability that make uh, density work? Uh, I mean, Vancouver has um, quite low property taxes uh, relative to other jurisdictions in, in the world and other jurisdictions in Canada. So, um, you know, I know there's a reluctance to, to do that, but uh, I think, you know, raising property taxes, doing them in a way that's, you know, more progressive, I kind of mentioned using uh, brackets, uh, doing away with things like the homeowner grant. Uh, I think there's actually much more capacity uh, at the local government level uh, between uh, you know, property tax changes uh, and, uh, and, and regulatory changes. So jumping over to Andrew then, um, what would uh, effectively downzoning for rental only look like uh, from your industry perspective, understanding you work for? <laughs> developer, yes. Well, not developer, uh, marketer in terms of uh, marketing. Yeah. Yes. And, and, yeah. and uh, Councillor Frey has about 30 seconds left on uh, his time. Oh, okay, well, it, it is something that's being explored already. We just have to look to New Westminster. Uh, certainly, it, uh, it, it caused a lot of fur with regard to uh, developers out there. Uh, and I think only time will really play out to see how the rest of the market uh, accepts that, that down zoning. But we all know that it is a tool now that is in the planner's toolbox. And we expect that it's going to be used uh, in, other, in other municipalities. And all the other municipalities are, are looking to New West to see what the ultimate implications are as they uh, as they see others potentially come to uh, in front of council. Sadly, out of time before I can get to Dr. Yeah. Arden, but okay, All right. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I have a few questions, so I'm hoping for succinct answers. Um, just preface that. My first one is to Mark Lee and just following up on Councillor Fry. Um, you suggested, um, as he was saying, doing away with CACs or DCLs, but you also said that all new development, quote, must contribute in some way to affordable housing. So to be clear, are you drawing a connection between those two and suggesting that in lieu of CACs, there would be affordability or inclusionary affordability requirements in developments, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the principle should be that all new housing development contributes to affordable housing, you know, either by directly providing that uh, by being, you know, part of uh, an overall package of housing that delivers a proportion of units or by paying, you know, in kind into sort of funds. So in a sense, I'm saying we should be replacing um, CACs with an affordable housing contribution. How, how is that, how is, just to be clear, how is that different? Because paying into a fund, a CAC is essentially a fund where a certain percentage is mandated to housing unless you change the percentage. That's well, why I, you were saying I, in favor of inclusionary zoning. Well, I feel like local governments have been relying too much on um, having the new growth paying for new services that benefit everyone, rather than having everyone pay for those services so that we all, through our property taxes, pay for the childcare that we need and the libraries that we need and community centers need. We don't just rely on new developments and a community amenity contribution uh, to cover that. But, but, but we should have something like a community amenity contribution that's specifically targeted to housing. I also am really, you know, not too happy around community many contributions that go for like, you know, a public art that's of, of dubious benefit. Well, maybe we could have a follow up conversation offline on that because those those dots are not connecting for me. Um, so I just wanted to flag that. Um, I do want to move on though, just for time. Um, my next question goes to John Rose and it's on the data, the backgrounder that was um, shared. And I'm wondering if you can comment on if you see a changing role or what that changing role looks like for Vancouver, because Yes, we are going to experience growth and so are all the other regions, but I was really interested to see that in terms of population employment and dwelling units, Vancouver will start having less than relative to the region and others. So I, AKA Surrey will eclipse Vancouver, people will move to suburbs more, et cetera. So can you comment on if you see the role of the city changing? 
So I mean, that's a great that's a great question, right? Because sort of what's the assumption uh, in terms of your planning? Is it to essentially just kind of respond to things uh, and just provide a sort of facilitating framework for you know development, uh, population, and jobs to kind of occur where you know they might quote unquote naturally occur? Or are you taking kind of a much more activist role in trying to say, look, we want this percentage of jobs to be located in, you know, the Burrard Peninsula, we are Vancouver proper, you know, we want this, uh, you know, being directed there. Um, and then what, you know, what's, what's the basis for that? And, you know, how does that kind of create perhaps some tensions uh, with, you know, other municipalities in the region and, and with Metro Vancouver as a whole? Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of, you know, the, the power of governments to exercise that degree of control over things. Um, but at the very least, that process should be as kind of data driven and evidence based as possible with assumptions clearly laid out. Okay, fair. I think it's a really interesting question to to ponder. So I appreciate that in the background data. Um, I also want to switch over to um, Professor Harton, if I can. Um, and sort of going to the commentary that you provided around that growth will happen, um, but it may be a different kind of growth. People with more options may not come here. Um, and so I'm wondering if, you know, sort of takeaway from what you're suggesting is that you think that cities should be laser focused on policy that really um, zeroes in on workforce housing and for lower income specifically, because those trends are going to exacerbate. Yeah, I mean, uh, to the to the extent that growth is going to increase land values, if especially if zoning is not adjusted to to um, accommodate for that growth, then um, yeah, the the most vulnerable populations will be the first ones to be displaced, and I think historically you already see that. Um, yeah, so yes, I agree with how you rephrased what I tried to say. Yeah, because I guess that's a question of what your enabling policy is is there for a reason in terms of ideally shaping growth that's going to happen. So that's what I was what I wonder if there's anything else you wanted to add there in the last little bit of time I have. Sure. Um, yeah. I, thank you. Um, yeah. So I guess you know, the deciding what kind of growth we want to have is is a theme that came up during the presentation again and again. And if you are interested in attracting and uh, retaining talent, then um, you need to provide housing options at as that at that level as well, as well as, you know, if you if you value diversity and, and want to uh, Vancouver to be home to low income populations as well, then you need to provide housing at that level. So different, um, I guess, goals and um, different housing options in line with those goals. Thank you, Professor Hart, and we'll have to leave it there. Um, over to Councillor DiGenova. Thanks so much. Um, my first question is for Mark. Mark, you had shown in your presentation some duplexes, and I had had actually been concerned about this from the start. Um, my background is in land economics, also working with non-market um, housing uh, for nonprofits that offers housing at shelter rates. So, in looking at the land economics recently, the Georgia Strait reported on. Uh, piece of land that was valued at 1.8 million a couple of years ago. Duplexes were built and each of the duplexes sold because you can strat stratify duplexes. You can't do that so easily with laneway houses, but you can do that with duplexes. And each of the duplexes um, on that land sold for 2 million and $2.1 million each. So how are we not increasing the actual value of land in building duplexes instead of other types of more dense housing in particular areas? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think it, it, it's a really good one because I think there is a concern that if we um, if we upzone, then the it'll just lead to uh, increased land values and then it doesn't actually, you know, turn the corner on affordability. Um, I think one way of diffusing that is by going for the type of broad-based uh, upzoning that I talk about. So, you know, right now we have a scarcity of, of uh, new density coming online. 
Um, and it's through this rezoning and CAC process that, you know, is problematic. So I think, you know, straightening that out and actually having a, a more broad-based upzoning across the city will diffuse those pressures. I also think that's where this idea of, a, of an affordable housing contribution in lieu of, of, a, of a CAC uh, comes into play as well, because that, that uh, puts, you know, down, will put downward pressure on that uh, potential for property um, uh, uh, land values to, to increase. Um, you, can I can I just ask? Do you approve right now of our blanket policy right now that you could rezone any single family lot into a duplex and sell it each side of it, stratify it and sell it for the same amount that you bought the land for? Well, I, I mean, I think that's a it's a positive step, but I think the constraint on that is that you've you've capped the total amount of a uh, buildable square feet. So it's the you know, you can you have one house at like say 2,500 square feet or, or duplex at, uh, at, at, you know, with the same amount of square feet split uh, in, into two. So- But um, if you have that split into two, this is my question though. The FSR on my the site. question is, you increase the FSR on the site, but you put the site up twice as much, thus you receive half the land for the same price. Would you rather us look at zoning in a way that we didn't blanket certain types of zoning, but you know, can considered zoning on a, a spectrum that's what i'm trying to look for sorry i'm i'm limited by time and i'm really interested by your answers here because you hit on you hit the nail on the head on something i've been asking questions um of staff and and uh looking at here at the city over my two terms so i'm just wondering if i mean do you have concern that that you know that duplex in the middle of a block could possibly um you know in a sense, uh, be underrealized in its opportunity because it could have been a part of the land assembly or something more dense. Yeah, I mean, we know that uh, you know just adding density will uh, tend to increase uh, property values or, or land values. So we want to look at ways of diffusing that. So I think kind of more broad-based blanket upzoning is one. This uh, idea of affordable housing contributions to make sure that the housing we build is actually contributing to affordable housing in cash or in kind uh, is is another, and then shifting towards uh, nonprofit or um, public models of, of build out uh, is another that way that we can get at it and, and actually deliver guaranteed dedicated affordable housing. Part of the problem now is that we're just leaving it to the market, and the market will build to what the what the market will bear. Um, you know, if they can get the thirteen hundred dollars per square foot of, of of new build, that's what the, what they're going to build, and that is going to get passed on one way or the other, whether it's rental or ownership. Fair enough. I don't have very much time, but also just wanted to ask you a quick question um, to whoever had said that public housing uh, should all be owned by the government. I'm just wondering, uh, how would you see uh, City of Vancouver paying the capital costs when the nonprofit throws their keys back at us for 60 years? I'll just quickly answer and say that I'm not sure it has to be public housing that's owned by government, I, and I'm sure not sure it's the local government. I think the federal government, and the ones that have the money in the province, you know, it's a big jurisdictional mishmash, but I don't think, Councillor, we should suggest we put more burden on the municipality. I just think the federal government should get back into the housing ownership business. The way REITs are, we have huge industry players and pension funds doing it. Why not the government? I'm with you on that, but thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's public land. Yeah, we'll have to continue on perhaps in the round table. Uh, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Chair Bly. Um, yeah, a quick question first to Mary. I I'm curious um, about your perspective on the, the Vancouver plan and the process, um, uh, given your experience, because we've had some criticism about the value and merit in actually developing a plan similar to what other municipalities have in terms of an official community plan. And um, if you could share your thoughts on that. I think as long as we're clear that plans need to be about provoking leadership and setting a direction and a vision, but you know, plans are constantly changing and we can't possibly know. I mean, we couldn't have possibly predicted where we are now, right? So you need to have a mechanism that, it, I think it's great to set people's aspirations and set a course. Here are our principles, here are the things we're after, here's what we're trying to realize. But I think that to have too heavily detailed and wedded a plan that can't be adjusted easily won't serve you well. We have to be nimble and agile and changing all the time. 
I appreciate that. And having done plans and strategies myself, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Um, my other question is to Dr. Harton, because um, you spoke about um, people coming for jobs and workforce housing and uh, some conversations taking place right now is around um, concepts of sort of micro units being built, but with larger kind of amenity spaces that would be shared for professionals. We've got many coming people from the tech sector and so on, but I know there's been concerns about livability. Um, and I'm just curious about your, your thoughts and perspective on that. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and following that trend, um, I think they just, the uh, big developer just uh, uh, announced um, plans for Vancouver property, but it's it's more common in LA and, and San Francisco already. Um, and I think the important thing to keep in mind is that this kind of housing, co-living housing, as the, it is at as it is proposed by those people is serving a very specific narrow demographic and for a specific time. And that's typically transition from education into um, employment and then uh, serving single uh, single households basically, right? Um, so it is, it's helping in the sense that those people are also having uh, difficulty finding adequate housing. They might not wanna use quite as much space as, as what they can find available, um, but it's only serving a very narrow demographic for a certain amount of time. Great, uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, I also wanted to circle back um, uh, I think Councillor Fry started on this question around, um, we, we've talked a lot this evening about housing, but um, the responsibility and part of our planning process is about looking at community amenities and infrastructure. And, and whether there's other panelists who wanna comment on, on the financing uh, of, of those amenities and, and infrastructure, because we were recently saw a report from staff that showed that between 2010 and 2020, um, about 40% of our DCLs went to housing and childcare and our CACs over the same period of time, it was about 50%, almost 50%. And so that doesn't leave very much for some of the other kind of needed things like community centers as an example. So I'm just curious if any other panelists wanna comment on that because it was a big topic at UBCM as well last week in terms of managing uh, as a municipality. I'll just chime in first and say that this is one of the strong advocacy positions that we need to take. We have a new, we have a government that's put itself into whatever role it's got for a couple of years anyway, and now's the moment to continue to strengthen the rapid housing initiative, the Canadian, the Canada Healthy Communities Initiative. The federal government is showing all sorts of ways that it wants to get money in directly in the hands of local municipalities to build different forms of infrastructure. They've modeled it now, and I think it's proven to be very effective. So I think we need to continue to suggest that's a model and a platform for getting more resources. The other thing is to probably revive urban development agreements. You've had one of the ones that's been most effective. We should try to get that as a more um, nimble model so that you don't have the logjam of resources. It's ridiculous what you have to finance off the property tax and some development charges. Ridiculous, not sustainable. Yeah, thank you for that. Is there any other panelists that wanted to comment on the, that question of public infrastructure? Thanks, Dr. Rose, I think. I could, yeah. I mean, I want to echo sort of what uh, Mark said earlier about the sort of way in which, you know, a cost of, you know, amenities uh, gets folded in through CACs and the like uh, to, you know, uh, there's an argument that it doesn't get passed along to the end consumer because it kind of gets, you know, factored into the pricing of land. But once the land is bought, any kind of, you know, for example, increase in CACs just gets added to the cost, right? And so there's kind of an interesting perspective here because if the city's position is that growth is good, and that the city as a whole benefits from growth, there seems to be kind of an inequity in that, the sense of the, the costs of that growth are then sort of downloaded onto the, you know, the purchasers of new housing, right? People coming into the region, as opposed to being kind of spread out, maybe more equitably, you know, considering some of those taxation uh, proposals uh, that have come out, you know, and Mark has mentioned. Uh, but I would echo Mary, I think really, this is a matter of other governments stepping up and providing further transfers to municipalities so that they can accommodate this growth that is driven by provincial and federal policies. Great, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, very thank much. you. I thought it was at my time. Thank you. I uh, Councillor Boyle. Um, thanks, I really appreciate this. And uh, I, I have a whole bunch of questions I'd love to ask, so I'll try to be quick, but um, I have a, a couple for you. First, Dr. Harton, um, I, I was really, uh, intrigued to hear you talk about um, housing scarcity as an inequality issue and particularly about the kind of generational or, or the inequality it creates for new residents and future residents. And I'd 
interested to hear if you have any thoughts on how we better incorporate the the needs and views of uh, younger generations and future residents in our decision making. Obviously, we um, who we hear from at public hearings are uh, current residents and often current and um, more comfortably housed residents as an over representation. And so I'd be interested to hear how you suggest we can better um, take those uh, folks into account when we make housing decisions. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, two points. Well, first, it's important to realize that for people that already own property, the scarcity is good, right? Because the scarcity is what is driving up land prices. So that's why there's this big political tension to get homeowners on board with upzoning, because as their current position is better with less housing. Um, and, and that brings me back to my second point to, to something that was discussed earlier, that upzoning right now is, yes, we see evidence that it is increasing land value, but only because there is so much pent up unmet demand, right? If you, if you spot up zone, uh, then all that pressure gets released. All these people that actually really would want to live in this location gets released on one location. And so that location will increase in land value with, with uh, higher zone capacity. If if everywhere in the region there was capacity to do that, and actually, you know, through no political in, uh, barriers to to get everywhere to to build more housing, uh, accommodate more people, those pressures would be more broadly distributed, and the land value increases from upzoning wouldn't be at the magnitude as, as we see them today. Um, so my, my two points. Okay, um, I have a follow up question to that actually, uh, which is. Obviously, there's lots of discussion about the impact that upzoning has on land values. Um, if we if we stopped upzoning anything, if we if we dramatically curtailed the development of new housing, um, what would happen to rents then? Um, I mean, I think that that's the situation that we are in right now, where supply is dramatically curtailed. And so what we see is that rents are going up, right? even in the pandemic, even in the, you know, when people were leaving downtown, rents dipped for a little bit, but but have since uh, recovered and are um, above um, pre-pandemic uh, levels. So curtailing so housing is increasing the, the price. So if we, we certainly hear that new secure market rental uh, concerns that new rental increases the rents, but I guess just to be clear, what you're saying is that no new rental would increase the rents a lot more. Yeah, exactly. That's my, my point. And that's, uh, I, I can talk about that later um, with regarding to filtering, adding luxury housing and how that might affect uh, rent levels. Um, I think at this point where we are all housing matters, but it is a matter of how fast um, it can reach people, you know, how fast we can build because there's always a time lag, right? Even if you zone now for more capacity, there is a couple of years of time lag until that building comes um, materializes. And so until then, uh, I think we will see um, rising rents for the foreseeable future. Okay, um, my next question, maybe I'll direct to Mark, though I'm certainly interested in in other thoughts. Mary, you touched on this too. Um, I think there's a lot of agreement. It's easy as a local government to agree that other levels of government should do more in terms of public housing. And, you know, we can unanimously agree that someone else should do more. Um, I'd be interested to hear what you think our role within the tools we have, limited as they are, far too limited, uh, what we should be doing more of in terms of encouraging more non-market, whether it's public or or community housing, what can we do on our own without just pointing fingers and waiting? In just 20 seconds or whoever's going to jump in to respond in a quick... Maybe question. Mary. I hear from Mark on this sometimes. <laughs> turn, turn more of your land over. Okay. Yeah, Anything exactly. to add, Mark? Reform property taxes. Um, you know, take the spirit of the of VAHA, the Vancouver Affordable Housing Agency, and the new Vancouver Affordable and Housing Endowment Fund, or whatever it's called, pool them together into a, a, a public agency that can get involved in the public land acquisition. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Councillor Reed. Um, yeah, my first question is for Sean or Mark, and it's determining housing needs per community, which was in your slide, um, Mark, but also 
Sean recognizing that we also need to know what economic tiers of housing is needed. So I saw in your slide it talked about the need to know how many people are in one neighborhood. Um, so people in that neighborhood can understand what density is coming and can look at all the different options that are available. So I'm wondering, do you think as part of Vancouver plan that's where we need to go, as well as the importance of understanding how much housing is for people under 80 grand, how much housing under 30 grand. So really understanding the needs. And that could be a follow-up too with Andrew on how do we make sure we're building the right housing for what you called the silver century to ensure that there's safe, adequate housing for people um, that are, want to age in their neighborhood. Um, through the chair, I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer that question. Uh, in terms of um, from the regional side, we take a holistic approach of here's the amount of units needed. Um, and as I noted in my presentation, uh, our focus, uh, we're not in, in the intimate details of uh, the local level. So there's a whole bunch of things that can happen uh, at the local level that uh, can influence uh, these items. And so we're not there every day to know what that is. And so that's why we maintain a much higher uh, 30, I'll call it the 30,000 foot view on uh, what is the general number of need. Okay, and follow up, Sean, do you not have in that high level a base understanding of what economic tiers are needed as well and what type of housing mix is missing in the region or you continue to state just on the number? Are we continue to stay on the number? Um, um, because we have to represent the, the whole region. And... Okay, um, Mark, do you want to talk a little bit more about what you talked about more on housing needs for community and maybe a little bit on the economic tiers that are needed? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, part of the reason why we're doing a uh, calling for big push on non-market housing uh, is because we can you know, deliver those at uh, much more uh, affordable rents. Uh, and, you know, there's potential for the deeper cost subsidies and, and that as well. I think there's huge, uh, as Professor Harden said, there's huge pent up demand for those missing middle forms, um, you know, uh, you know, ground oriented uh, on quiet streets, um, working to you know, reinforce the idea of, you know, complete communities. So they're really pushing in multiple ways uh, to our, our climate uh, objectives uh, as, as well. So, um, you know, all of these, it's hard to say. I mean, I think someone commented earlier, like wanting data, but we don't, when we're making projections about the future, we don't have data. We just have projections. We have assumptions we can make about births and deaths and immigration. They're not data. Data we only have when we look in the, look into, into the past. Uh, and the reality is that Vancouver is going to continue to be a, a vibrant city and a popular destination, particularly as climate change bites even harder. There are going to be lots of places um, around the world, in fact, around British Columbia, uh, that are going to need uh, safe havens, and Vancouver is going to be one of those. And we should be planning to build out for that. Um, that's just the harsh reality of the world we live in, and our failure to deal with climate um, uh, action to date. Thank you, Andrew. Sure. Yeah. You know, to jump onto your question about the neighborhoods uh, and in terms of sort of that uh, that stratification, I don't know if uh, if the neighbor if van plan is the place for that. I think that's more the, the realm of the neighborhood plans. Mary what might want to jump in with regard to sort of like a, the van plan or the longer term plan, having that that big strategic vision uh, that sort of sets the tone for some of those underlying uh, some of those underlying plans. So uh, just a, a quick comment on one of your of your other questions. With regard to the, the seniors in the silver century, it, it's been years since I've updated the research, but uh, we'll do it when the new census come out. And it's fascinating to look at uh, the number of empty bedrooms in certain parts of, of the city. And that's uh, with regard to that sort of that older aging population and that empty nester stage of the life cycle who have more bedrooms in their houses than they actually physically can inhabit. I think one of those issues in terms of making sure that we've got a good stable uh, set of housing that is adequate for that older generation is to allow some of those older communities, RS zones, uh, to actually change and uh, allow some of those bigger older houses to either be duplexed or to be uh, assembled and for some to have some higher density stuff uh, built on it. I know my parents were in this situation for the longest time. They weren't really tied necessarily to the bricks and mortar of their big four bedroom house that we grew up in. It was the community. 
and the degree, degree that we can help foster some of that change at that local neighborhood level in some of those currently single detached neighborhoods, uh, it's going to benefit not just the seniors, but uh, the newer generation of householders are going to move in as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Councillor Weaver. We're going to have to leave it there. Um, and I am last on the queue. I just have a couple follow-up questions. And actually, um, Andrew, I'll just ask if you can continue on. You mentioned neighborhood plans, and we actually haven't talked about that yet tonight. And I'm curious what your advice would be to council as we reconcile um, the Vancouver plan. You talked about that sort of bigger, broader, we've heard words like visionary plan, with very um, well-developed neighborhood plans that have been um, sort of the blood, sweat, and tears of residents right across the city who are very, very attached to these plans. And so how do we bring those two things together? It, it is not an easy thing to do by any stretch of the imagination, uh, as it would be a different conversation if there had been an ongoing Vancouver plan and to now bring in the Vancouver plan on top of those neighborhood plans is, is certainly not going to be a, uh, an easy thing to do. But this goes back to some of the, the comments that Mary made about that document in and of itself being sort of broader, strategic, as well as adaptable. Uh, I, I think the reality is that you're not going to fit every single one of those neighborhood plans into some of that, but it into the, the regional or citywide plan. But there should be some small aspects that are certainly reflected down into each of those neighborhood plans. Okay, no, that's really helpful. Um, distinguishing between the two. Um, Dr. Rose, I wonder if you could comment on, um, you had said, you advised council um, that the Vancouver plan should answer the question, why do we have a demand problem? And I wondered if you could start us off with answering that question. Well, the, the specific question was, why do we have an unmet demand problem? Because, Sorry, unmet demand problem. You know, yeah, no worries. Um, because, you know, the, the, the targets are, are significantly shaped by this, um, this assessment of unmet demand. And I don't ab absolutely don't dispute, right, that we have an affordability issue. There's lots of people living in housing for which they're paying an inordinate amount of their incomes to support, uh, that there's uh, housing that doesn't suit their needs, um, that's you know, substandard in terms of maintenance. Uh, I guess the fundamental question then is, well, before, you know, you just start putting numbers out there, you know, we need to do this and we need to do that, is to think then of how that fundamentally addresses the underlying causes. You know, why do you have this unmet demand problem? And there's sort of two aspects of this, right? Because, you know, you hear, I mean, a lot of the discussion tonight is kind of focused on, you know, regulation and identifying income brackets and this kind of housing and that kind of housing. And, you know, I would well imagine that many industry proponents would say that the, the most efficient allocator of housing is the market, right? You know, the kind of free market sort of fundamentalists would say, well, look, you know, governments are going to be fairly inefficient at this kind of job and that, you know, we can do this best. So there's a question, well, why haven't they done that best? And moreover, um, will if, if you follow that logic, will this kind of prescriptive model um, arguably kind of create a, a, an additional housing system where you have not kind of perfect competition, but you have a number of kind of connected players who know how to navigate the, the kind of hoops that you create at City Hall? Um, so that was kind of like the supply element, you know, in terms of kind of a critique of this approach. Of course, the demand side approach is to say, look, you know, citizens are going to be quite skeptical of upzoning uh, if you don't get a handle on what are seen as illegitimate sources of demand, right? So why upzone if that neighborhood's just going to be left vacant because somebody purchases the property as an investment property? Um, right. Those okay, are the so fundamental questions. Can I can I then ask just a um, segue from there? We've we've seen and we hear on council often people say. You know, I really agree that we need density in this area, but would prefer to see row homes or townhomes and sort of this ideal supply. Um, but of course, the the land value it just doesn't work, and particularly for rental, which is what we've seen we we need more of in the city, and especially if we want a fair representation of added density right across the areas of the city and not just in one particular area. What do we have available to us? We've talked about up zoning. We've talked about down zoning. What do you think is the better tool? And as I mean, perhaps if Dr. Rose, you want to start, but anyone else wants to jump in. Yeah, I would say I mean, everyone on the panel, you know, has their areas of expertise. I might, I might defer to Mark in terms of kind of specific models, but you know, one thing that resonated for me earlier was, you know, his his notion that you know we need actual 
public housing or you know use of public land so that you reduce the the costs so that you can actually deliver affordable housing because otherwise the land market is it the best use of public land to build a row homes when what uh, we need is a lot more supply and low market housing well, you'd have to crunch the numbers and see exactly how many units you could be providing, uh, uh, whether it's rental or ownership that actually you know meets the needs of people. You know, not just the 600 square foot condominium, but perhaps you know a two or three bedroom uh, row home. Okay, great. Well, um, I appreciate those responses. Sorry, that is the end of my time. Um, I believe now we are actually going to yes, this concludes the council. Uh, question period. And so I'm going to pass it, it over to Diana for concluding remarks from the panel. But let me just hold. I do have a five minute break in my agenda. So I think we should take that now. Give everyone a chance just to quickly stretch their legs. And then we'll come back at 8.15 or 15 minutes past the hour, depending on what time zone you're in, Mary. And uh, yeah, we'll be right back.
Okay, we are back at 8.15 clerks. I just wonder if you would let us know when we are ready to go. Do we have quorum? Yes, we have quorum now. Great, thank you very much. So welcome back um, everyone. We are moving to the concluding um, part of our evening this evening and I am gonna pass um, the, the uh, back, oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna pass it over to Diana for concluding remarks um, from the panel. Great, thank you Deputy Mayor and welcome back everyone. So we're, we're going to shift now into the panelists kind of round table discussion portion of the workshop. I just want to quickly reflect on some of the kind of key themes that we heard emerging and I certainly won't be able to cover all of them. It was a very robust discussion, but we heard quite a bit about equity, um, talked about who we're growing for, looking at the changing demographic and how that influences decision making, um, looking at how demand might um, uh, cause us to think about how we're paying for infrastructure. So a whole vast array of topics here. And really what we're hoping is to hear from the panelists a bit more uh, about what they might think are some of the critical success factors that the city really does need to take into consideration as they're exploring different approaches to growth. And we have heard some recommendations some very um, sage advice already so far, but if there's anything that folks would like to elaborate on or reflect on um, based on the first half of our, our workshop this, this evening and some of the questions coming from council, um, we'll open up the floor to that now. So. Um, just just raise your hand and I'll uh, keep a speaking order and, and we'll have a great discussion until about 8.55. Okay, I'll kick it off. Is that okay, Rebecca or Diane? Go for it. Um, one of the things that I, I find absolutely fa fascinating is, is this issue of filtering. Uh, it's looked at in a couple of different ways and uh, but I think one of the maybe statements, it's not one of mine, it's uh, from uh, Jim Hutniak. Uh, he's, he made the comment once that uh, today's rental housing is tomorrow's affordable housing, uh, but that's predicated on adding that rental housing today. And we certainly on the starts and completions side uh, have come into a new era of, uh, of housing supply for rental starts, uh, which will become completions by and large within the next two to three years. So certainly a thumbs up on that. But we've also had a, a change at the federal government level where there is, I'm going to say, maybe a renewed interest in what they rolled out in 2018 as their national housing strategy. Uh, and as part of that, they're proposing what they're calling an accelerator fund, uh, which is intended for municipalities to try and uh, streamline things to, uh, to add supply in a quicker manner. So I think I, for me, the focus in terms of some of the, if there was any kind of strategic things, it's certainly advocating up to uh, both the provincial uh, level as well as, uh, as the national level to try and lever as much as we can out of what I would call at the national level, at least this new and renewed uh, enthusiasm for adding housing and whether that be through partnerships uh, or ownerships, as, as Mary had said, uh, is one thing. Uh, and then maybe certainly at the provincial level as well as the expert panel uh, on supply and affordability had some great suggestions within their framework as well. Thank you. Care to reflect on that around the panelist table? Thank you for that very much. Um, perhaps who would like to go next in terms of providing some, some more advice or recommendations or things really that need to be thought through related to. Well, I can, I can oh. build on that if I may, Diana, I just to say that, that I do think that the, that um, the national housing strategy was a, was a signal, but, and they and they did put in their platform that they wanted to create this other fund. I think there's just a growing recognition that you don't have the capital uh, within a municipal government structure, you don't have enough resources, and the market hasn't distributed the way it needs to. So my view on this is that we need a whole plethora of tools. We need 
and, and you can do your part and then we need others to do their part. It has to do with making land available, it has to do with creating let, more enabling conditions, fewer restrictions, all that kind of stuff. And and I also think this comment about what the new rental, you know, the, uh, the one, today's affordable is tomorrow. What was it? Today's rental is tomorrow's affordable. Affordable, yeah. Is that I, I would, I think if you were wanted to be really brave, you'd stop talking about growth. You know, growth is going to happen. Uh, why we need to have growth as a stated goal, I have no idea. Growth is happening. And uh, you don't have to establish that. So really what you want to do is focus on the place that you've got and how do you actually maximize the, the, the capacity that you have on the space that you've got and make that better for the people that live here now and then obviously accommodate as the growth happens. But don't put, you don't need to put that in your goal statement. Good God, everybody knows you're growing. So I would suggest that we move people's attention to different kinds of units, different kinds of spaces, different kinds of tenancy, different kinds of land ownership. You can pilot a lot of stuff and you've got, and, and I think we, we, if we could in, disentangle all the rules around investment so that we could actually free up some of that 212 billion that's sitting in people's bank accounts into smaller increments so that they can do laneway housing and accessory dwelling and all that kind of stuff. It's gonna take all of that. And the other thing I would just say about the election campaign is you can see that we can, we can depoliticize this now. It does not have to be partisan. It does not have to be right versus left. It can kind of be all of us together trying to be resourceful about how to build stuff from the ground up. Thanks, Mary. Anyone want to follow up on that? Yes, go ahead, uh, Mark. I mean, uh, Mary's comment would be a great way of ending the session because she, she said it so eloquently. Um, I think, you know, really, we, uh, we need to use growth as our friend to shape the type of city that we want to live in in the future. And that, you know, the object of that should be um, making sure that the, what we build is, is climate friendly and, you know, climate resilient uh, and, uh, and affordable. Uh, and so it's more than just about sort of housing supply in the aggregate and the abstract, but it's, it's really questions about what type of housing and for whom and, and what type of social benefits we provide in addition to, to private gains. Um, I think we should be challenging some of the core assumptions about housing in Vancouver, who owns and finances new development, uh, whether the path forward should be primarily about home ownership and built by for-profit developers, uh, whether home ownership be the, should be the central means by which people achieve economic security. Um, we have a culture that's very deep in Vancouver of, of building equity through home, home ownership. Uh, it's very entrenched and it's been abetted by skyrocketing land values. And in fact, I think the intergen intergenerational transmission of those gains to, to young people uh, who can only get into the market because they're uh, because of the bank of mom and dad. Uh, you know, is is hugely uh, problematic. So uh, we should be looking at a lot of housing development. I think you know, Mary's spot on that there's a whole bunch of different models and different tenure arrangements that we can use to have affordable and diverse housing choices, much more community oriented, non-market housing and alternative housing forms. Uh, and, uh, you know, let's just, let's throw that open and, and build, the, build the city that we want to. And I think those type of ideas should really be at the heart of the Vancouver plan. Yes, John. Hi, Mark. I just want to sort of build on what you just said there in terms of, you know, this discussion around rental versus ownership, uh, because I'm much more comfortable around sort of propositions to increase rental housing when that's sort of essentially in kind of collective ownership, right? You know, as kind of part of a, you know, a, a public enterprise, if you will. Uh, I'm a little more dubious of sort of push towards rental where you actually never really get rid of the ownership question, right? So you'd have people renting uh, and, you know, um, not, yes, as you say, building sort of uh, that equity, but I would say moreover, having less security of tenure, um, which is important, right? That's an element of ownership. Uh, but in that other sort of non-governmental mode, there still is somebody who owns the land, right? So if, you know, we kind of trade off, you know, individual ownership for rental, uh, but with the land owned by large corporate entities who are simply then renting it out. Uh, that's a very, for me, very troubling. And I'd hate to see this kind of push towards rental uh, be distorted that way and essentially provide cover for a rather more concentrated, almost ol oligopolic you know, ownership structure. And that's actually happening with the financialization of housing. You've got 
large, large REITs and other kinds of investment vehicles starting to buy up housing and then rent it out. So it, it, it exacerbates the vulnerability that you're suggesting. But don't you think there's another way to intervene on this, uh, John, so that you can actually, I mean, that regulation, that regulatory discipline has to come from the federal government in terms of financialization of housing. Let's see if they can get their act together. There, in the meantime, we could create other kinds of vehicles for co-ops, investments, credit unions, school boards, lots and lots of different institu faith institutions, lots and lots of other ways to incrementally create different kinds of units, right? I, I worry nope. a little bit that, yeah. that I, I worry a little bit that because we have to fight the big bad guys, which we're trying to do, uh, we're going to then shut out all the other possible players that could get in in participating, mm. right? No argument for me, Mary, at all. I, I agree with what you've said 100%. Yeah, I would love to see some vehicles like, um, you know, maybe Van City or one of the other credit unions could could pioneer this that allow, um, you know, not super affluent, but kind of just normal affluent um, households who have some savings to put those into vehicles that invest in the local economy that deliver a decent but not exorbitant rate of, of return yeah, um, that fun. are, you know, doing things like, you know, building the uh, affordable housing uh, rental stock. Uh, that we need um, right now, like you, you sort of are your 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 choices are kind of ethical funds, which are sort of dubious in terms of how ethical they are. Or you need to have like you know three four hundred thousand dollars in capital to be able to to get in the game with uh, some of the more you know active um, you know investment um, vehicles. And you know a lot gets lost in in that in that translation. So I, I think there's there's a space there for uh, for vehicles and working with local financial institutions as as conduits for that type of capital. To flow into the projects that, that we need, you know, in addition community to bonds, community bonds. It's not that difficult. Uh, Julia. Yeah, thank you. Just two points. Um, one on growth. And uh, I, I just wanted to add a, maybe a little more nuance to that, that, um, you know, we really have to recognize that over the last couple of decades, and it's been much slower than, you know, compared to industrialization, where it, urban growth happened with kind of a bang. Um, but we really had a restructuring of the economy and towards an economy that is knowledge and service based, which is much more urban than, than other parts of the economic production, right? So there's there's been a moment of economic restructuring that has been slow and that's fueling this, this growth. So, uh, but if you compare it to um, industrialization, taking the long view here, back then there was a big response housing response to 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 house all those workers right we we haven't seen such a large scale housing response now and so i think um um yeah this this plan planning is an opportunity to do that um <clears throat> the other point uh, that i picked up on, on what some of the other panelists said was um not not to focus only on new supply and i agree with that we could also look at how to maintain current supply um, and, and increase supply incrementally through subdivisions um, smaller extensions all these things um, will also help right it, it may not be the big solution but as, as as mary said we need all kinds of different housing going forward so these 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 um, uh, measures or policies to enable what we do with existing housing stock should also um, be considered Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, just to build on, on Julia's comment about taking the long game and the impacts of industrialization, uh, we can actually look at that not necessarily with regard to the long game, but the medium term game as well as we saw building and, and construction in Canada come way up during the 1970s, basically to accommodate the post-World War II boom as they aged out of mom and dad's houses. Uh, and this was the era that CMHC and the, and the federal government were involved and some of the other panelists may be able to speak a little bit more eloquently because I was just born around that time. But things like MERBs and, and all kinds of different vehicles for actually adding a greater variety of supply. And I think that's, again, where we're at right now in terms of uh, some of the objectives, whether it be municipally, provincially, uh, let me put regionally in there for Sean, uh, provincially or or federally as well. Yeah, I think I would add to that as well by you know noting that like part of my impetus for for wanting to upzone the RS neighborhoods is that I think we should actually be protecting existing affordable rental stock. 
Uh, I think there's a lot of pressure right now for developers to uh, buy up existing affordable rental stock and convert it into higher density, but not necessarily uh, affordable uh, uh, rental stock. So let's let's protect the existing uh, stock that's there. Maybe even reinvest in it, uh, particularly with the with the climate lens in mind. Uh, fuel switching, energy efficiency upgrades. Um, you know, really um, you know, transform the building envelopes with with deep retrofits to to you know and and you know save the embodied energy that went into making that building uh, in the first place. Um, we should also be just thinking about transitional measures for renters in general, and that's something I wanted to talk about in my presentation, but kind of ran out of time. And you know that you know fair process for people who are uh, displaced, uh, including temporary accommodations and, and various um, other things in in. The rush to densify single-family neighborhoods. Uh, there, there is a legit concern that people who are in secondary suites uh, could, could get displaced, uh, and we should make sure that we are we're thinking about that as well. I think even sort of the the gold standard stuff like in Burnaby, their renter protections, they, it's only like uh, six units and above um, size buildings. Uh, so, but we can take those same principles and, and apply them uh, further down. So, uh, making sure that um, the most vulnerable, like you know, renters are already get up getting kind of shafted in our, in our current market uh, and you know, we should make sure we don't pile on uh, and make it worse for them. John, you wanted to add there? Yeah, that's a great segue because I was, you know, very interested in kind of the implications of upzoning on the affordability of, you know, not only secondary suites, but also, of course, the owners of those detached homes who really rely upon those secondary suites is like a mortgage helper. Um, so, you know, if, if the idea, uh, and, and if I had had more time today, I would have talked about this because if the idea was in your target setting to kind of move, say, 20,000 secondary suite households into some kind of brand new purpose-built rental construction, you know, there are implications. Uh, and in fact, during our session back in May, uh, Andy Ann touched upon that. Uh, he's fine with me speaking about it, by the way. Um, and he touched upon that, and he talked about, in particular, the kind of uh, impacts that would have on ethnocultural minorities within the city of Vancouver. So which adds a different, you know, an additional kind of lens to this from an equity perspective. But Mark, I was curious, right? Because if your argument was around, you know, leveraging uh, up zoning, not only to kind of create housing, but also to, you know, perhaps then through land value inflation to kind of provide a, you know, an additional source of revenue via property taxation, um, I'm cur I'm concerned about the implications of that, not only for the, say, the homeowners, but if those increased costs are passed on to the renters of secondary suites, uh, could that not create displacement? Yeah, I mean, the reason I raised the rental um, issue in the first place was just out of concern to make sure that we, we think about uh, the implications of displacement. I know that's a topic that council has thought about, um, you know, a lot in, in different contexts uh, as well. I think, you know, and to, to Andy Ann's point, I think there's a, a lot of interesting possibilities for uh, upzoning models that uh, that do take multi-generational families into account. So, you know, you have a, a family that own, owns a house and now their kids are growing up. You're able to redevelop that, uh, you know, one uh, larger unit into, you know, five or six units, which could include uh, units for your grandparents and units for the other parts of family. Maybe there's two other rental units that go into that as, as mortgage helpers. So, you know, there's kind of a, a mix of, of those um, and, and, and in a way that will actually, you know, pencil out. And it's similarly with sort of aging in place, you know, you know models where the people would want to stay in, in their homes or stay on the land that they've been on for you know, decades in some cases, uh, but then be able to uh, get uh, a, a new suite out of, you know, four or five that's developed while renting out uh, the others and having that, uh, that stream of, of rental income. So I feel like there's a lot of potential for, for, for innovative models uh, along the way with with the upzoning, but and, but always trying to be mindful of the making sure that we're not doing it in a way that's inflating uh, land values. And my point on the property tax was more that we should have more progressive property taxes and rebalancing of property taxes in order to purchase um, public land that could then be turned over to nonprofits or be developed in the public sector uh, to build some of the really dedicated, genuine, affordable housing that. So we, oh yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Just a quick jump in on that one. And just Mark, I'd like to just unpack your statement about uh, protecting all rental uh, a little bit. I think uh, 
Well, we'd all agree that we need to protect that uh, that historical rental stock because it is what is most affordable. Uh, I just caution putting some kind of blanket statement over protecting all existing rental. Uh, I look at I'm part of the conversations for the the new Broadway plan, and you look at uh, just the sheer number of units along uh, that Broadway corridor uh, with this new transportation infrastructure that's going in. Uh, I think there's certainly some opportunity for upzoning for a lot of those areas where, you know, you look at that old stock that's built in the 1960s, built in the 1970s, it is at the end of its functional lifespan for a lot of it. Uh, and without reinvestment, it's going to continue to degrade. I think there's a lot of opportunities along some of those areas where from a planning side of things, we could add uh, a significant amount of density, but do it in a way that, again, protects the existing renters, uh, offering them space in those places uh, and, uh, and, and accommodate more people without this sort of blanket policy across all, uh, all rental. Can I just make a, a little plea as a, as a non-Vancouverite uh, listening to you folks? Uh, I can appreciate that there's a, an urgency and a fixation on housing there and that uh, it's part of the national narrative is that Vancouver's in a housing crisis, but, and you're, you're certainly living up to it as I listen to you, but you know, you, you're, you're in, your planning needs to be about a lot more than just housing. And I think the interventions you're going to make need to be supporting a whole bunch of different ways that you create complete communities. So, as I said earlier, like public realm investments, how you're actually making things fit together. I'm interested in how little I've heard about transit. I can appreciate there's a jurisdictional issue here, but you know, mobility and how you're going to actually distribute across the region is just critical. And as we see now with work from home becoming a more preferred pattern for lots of folks and industries that will support that, you know, again, the notion of growth may actually morph into something quite different. So I would just encourage you to just not allow yourselves to be tugged only in that direction. You know, the old story, I, I don't know the metaphor well enough, but you've got a hammer, everything's a nail. You're sounding a little bit like that, just saying. Um, I just would like to make one little plug about um, the economy. You know, when you look at main streets, and we have a big campaign on this, so it's obviously fixating in my head, and I, we've been working with lots of stakeholders and with the city in Vancouver about how do we actually uh, invest in main streets and independent businesses. Above main street businesses are often generally second and third floors that have a kind of uh, low income, marginal, small housing, modest housing, right? Lots of single room occupancy. They are traditionally above those mom and pop shops. And when you see development and some a developer comes in and assembles six, eight, 10, 12 lots, and then goes up six or eight stories with a setback and a podium and does the Vancouverism thing, you lose those affordable units. You lose the space for those folks. And we've got to allow ourselves to be imaginative about where do those folks actually go? They don't go into that new development and they don't probably go, they probably don't go into public housing. So they really are shit out of luck, as they say. And so I think we've got to try to combine integrated attempts here to keep the quality of a place and intensify it, but intensify it in a way that a lot, that doesn't get us preoccupied with how much density, how it has to work. Do you know what I mean? We've got to try to find a way to invest in a whole bunch of different things. I guess that's my little sawhorse that I'm on. Hobby horse. Thank you. <laughs> Some kind of horse. Some kind of horse. <laughs> Do, <laughs> great. So, uh, one of the things that kind of keeps emerging and that I've noticed as a key theme is around the aging demographics. And is there, are, are there other things that you'd like council to think about and staff to think about related to planning for the aging demographics? Several of you raised that during your um, presentations this evening and would anyone like to comment further on that? I'm more than happy to make comments on that, but I think Julia had her hand up. As oh, I'm sorry, Julia, so sorry. Julia, why don't you jump in? Yeah, thank you. I, I was just going to um, add on to Mary's comment, uh, one about quality of place and who is benefiting and then on transit. Um, so I, I think, again, like a basic land market economics insight is that if you improve the place, you're going a place through whatever planning measure, it's, it's going to be reflected in rising land values around it, right? And then if you have uh, renters in particular, they're at very high risk of de being displaced, of not actually benefiting from investment in the place. And so that's 
it's something I just wanted to stress. The other thing uh, was the investment in transit, because uh, I briefly mentioned that when I was talking earlier, but it might have gotten lost, um, is that, you know, the way to create more urban space, more places with great accessibility that are in high demand, one way is to increase zoning to allow for denser um, housing, but another way is to actually increase the connectivity to other places in the region and um, investing in the infrastructure to making place accessible, accessible by actually having the infrastructure to move people quickly around into the places that they want to go. So I just wanted to add that on. Thank you. Do you want me to jump in on demographics? Sure, if you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think sort of the aging in place one and, that, and catering to that older demographic and that silver century is, is certainly fundamentally important for the city. Uh, there's lots of uh, big areas of the city that uh, could certainly uh, do with some densification and allow some of that transition of that uh, elderly empty bedroom population to be more suitably housed and allow sort of the next generation of kids to get in. But we also have to just recognize the other demographics as well. And it, city of Vancouver is a little bit different. We've heard that we are disproportionate relative to the rest of the region on the rental housing side, also on the apartment side of things. We're a little bit disproportionate on that younger side of the demographic as well in that sort of 20 to 30, 35 year old age group. And that's historically been the case for the city. If we go way back to the 1970s, uh, and it is that prominence of the apartment stock that draw and rental that draws that particular demographic in as well. So uh, I, I don't necessarily think we should just be focusing on that notion of the silver century. Um, we need to look at the, like the notion of uh, the missing middle. It's kind of genius, not just with respect to housing, also on the demography side of things as well. Um, we need to look at, uh, at all cohorts going through there as well to figure out how most reasonably we can let our city change, not necessarily grow, uh, along all lines uh, in terms of uh, each respective demographic. That's Andrew. Mark, did you want to add anything there? You're shaking your head in two directions, so I can't tell. Uh, so many things to say. Um, I really like the, uh, the streetcar plans that came out um, the other week. You know, it seems like a bargain at a billion dollars. Um, we should build that thing. Um, I also think I, in terms of like uh, seniors and aging, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for seniors housing and healthcare to be public sector anchors for complete communities. And if we think about strategic investments in, in that way, they can help reinforce uh, the you know, emerging neighborhood centers that we're, we're trying to cultivate through a planning. And obviously, you know, other housing plays a, a part in that as well. But I think you know, things like residential care or assisted living um, you know, are, are another other alternative modes of, of aging in place, or at least staying in the same neighborhood. John, did you want to add something there? Uh, it's kind of unrelated. I mean, my apologies, Mary, it comes back specifically to housing. Um, you know, and maybe it's kind of, I think when we were asked to participate this evening, and maybe it's premature for me to do this, we were sort of asked to give, you know, maybe some advice uh, to, you know, to the planning department. And, uh, and you know, uh, one thing that gets me here, one thing I'm kind of concerned about is, you know, again, coming back to, you know, planning for growth in this kind of uh, city of Vancouver process, which is, you know, very, um, Kind of definitive right and kind of saying look these are our targets and this is the basis for those targets um and then that information kind of gets broadcast and i guess my advice to the city and kind of founded on a concern which also then connects in with some data questions and some like assumptions uh is that you know you send out this message we need eighty one thousand, you know uh we, you know we have this housing need right and and honestly the numbers in terms of new uh, demand coupled with existing housing need. I see the logic there, even if I might quibble with some of the particulars, right? But then that number kind of gets broadcast and there's a sort of assumption then, um, and I can well imagine this, right? Where you see, you know, the development industry comes out and says, hey, look, it's evidence we don't have just enough units. We need 81,000 units over the next 10 years. Um, but in our conversation tonight, you know, it's been much more nuanced than that, right? It's, you know, it's not just 81,000, it's, you know, 81,000 of this type and that comprised of this type and that type to meet particular objectives. 
So I guess advice wise would be, you know, to say, A, there has to be some very kind of careful messaging and, and clarity around exactly what this supply and what this growth is intended for uh, and what it's comprised of. And then how that's actually met, right? Because is it 81,200 net new construction, you know, completions minus demolitions? Is it, you know, that number minus some units that are already in the pipeline, right? So I remember back to the Housing Vancouver strategy where there's, you know, 72,000 unit target, but that included 30,000 units already, condos already in the development pipeline. Um, so there are these actually, you know, very significant kind of implications to how we then envision, right? You know, how the, the trajectory of growth and how that's actually going to be accommodated. Uh, it, on the other hand, is it accommodated, like as Mark has suggested, through some kind of innovative means of almost kind of leveraging existing areas uh, in very creative ways that don't kind of cause huge land inflation, you know, via huge land assemblies with market development uh, that can actually then provide that uh, necessary space, you know, room for new people and for existing people with unmet housing demand. So that's my kind of multi-point uh, piece of advice for the city here uh, is in terms of messaging, uh, in terms of clarifying where those numbers come from and where they go um, and, and guarding against maybe the misuse of those numbers. Yeah, the Housing Vancouver strategy, I think, is really interesting and innovative because I think it does actually, you know, break things down into different housing types and different income groups. And then it gives a basis for tracking that over time of how sex successful we've been. And, you know, it maybe could be better and we could do better in, in, in filling in some of the, the, the areas where we haven't done uh, as well. But I think that kind of intention where um, we're, we're trying to build the housing that we need as opposed to just letting the market decide uh, is is definitely the uh, the right orientation that we should be having. But I, I overall, we should, if the if you're better off building too much than not building enough, right? Because if you don't build enough, we know that's just going to lead to you know ever a worsening yeah, uh, um, affordability. If we build too much, hey, prices might go down, um, rents might go down. You know that's 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 the bad side of building too much. All right. Thank I, you. I would just dispute that, Mark, but maybe for another time. Um, yeah. All right. So, John, Mark, you've uh, kind of made your last statements here. Uh, I think those are those are great uh, parting thoughts. And uh, I saw that you have your hand up there, Andrew, and we'll and then we'll come to the rest of the folks, Mary and, and Julia, to uh, provide their final words of wisdom to the city. Go ahead, Andrew. Thanks. I, I was going to jump in and say, you know, I, I, I hate offering advice, but yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> John started it. So, hey, why don't I continue it? If, <laughs> if I was going to offer any advice with regard to, and Mary, sorry, again, we're focusing on housing, but uh, uh, with regard to meeting housing need along that housing, the whole housing continuum, in terms of whether it be for van plan to 2050 or for the 10 year housing targets, Again, v Vancouver doesn't operate within a vacuum within this region, and to some degree, to the degree to which we are successful at alleviating homelessness or catering to a specific income group, we can't do that alone. There's just going to be more people from Burnaby or from Ontario coming and saying, geez, like, look at all this great housing that these guys are adding out here. Uh, and they may just come to it. So uh, there needs to also be some regional coordination uh, with regard to some of these issues as well. And I would love something like the Vancouver plan and some of those targets. I'd love to see that reflected through other municipalities to show that there is this uh, uh, a concerted effort to address all aspects of, of the housing continuum going forward. So there's my final thoughts. Great, thank you. Mary, did you want to uh, share any final thoughts with uh, the group here? I think you should challenge yourselves to develop an urban development agreement, a new tri-level agreement on whatever you decide to focus on. It should be on a bunch of things. And why don't you model what federalism, the future of federalism needs to look like in a predominantly urban country uh, as Canada is with a constitution that was made at a time when we weren't. So I think you could you could build on your history of this you have a provincial government that might be amendable, and I think you have a federal government that's trying to figure it out. So be ambitious and build the terms. You lead it and build the terms for what an invest, a new kind of investment deal would look like uh, for an urban development agreement to cover three or four domains that are critical to you. Mental health, I would guess. Housing, obviously. Uh, whatever the other things are that you decide to focus on. Climate. 
uh, why don't you set the why don't you set that mark for the country? Thanks, Mary. And finally, I'll turn to you, Julia. What would you like to share? As a... Yeah, sure. I I also hate giving advice. Um, uh, I guess many many good points have already been raised. So just one final thing to add. Um, is to yeah to think about housing and provision of housing not just within the city but as the city within the region and with that i mean the functional region what is really um reasonable commute times that what what places can reasonably still be inhabited by people to work in the city center right like that that should be the functional region that you consider for housing supplying housing for jobs and growth in vancouver um and 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 again to my point earlier mary's point earlier that includes um investment not only in housing but in infrastructure to make more make basically expand that functional region by making places more connected, um, um, creating more available uh, housing that can reasonably be used for people that work in Vancouver and that can commute in then. So, my last point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. And I would just really like to take a moment to thank all of the panelists this evening for all of your time. We're coming to the end of our time together. Um, I'd also like to thank Sean Galloway and uh, Edna Cho and, and Susan Haid as well for their opening comments and um, really appreciate uh, the, the discussion and the varied points of view. So thank you so much for sharing uh, with us this evening. Uh, as was mentioned earlier in the coming months, the city of Vancouver is going to be engaging the public on these same questions, issues, and uh, looking at opportunities for growth. And so this feedback this evening, the, the uh, remaining series of workshops and uh, technical work is all going to help inform and guide and the planning process for the Vancouver plan. So very grateful for you all to have played a role in that this evening. And I'll now return to uh, Deputy Mayor Bly to adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much, Diana. And um, thank you for your facilitation of um, the conversation with the panelists and echoing your thanks to um, all of our panelists that joined us tonight, as well as the staff team. So with that, this concludes um, the business on today's agenda. May I have a motion? Motion to, to adjourn. Thank you very much. Councillor Hardwick, a seconder, please. Councillor Boyle. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. All those in favor? Yay. Aye. Yay. Any opposed? The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. This special council meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so Thank much, you everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, folks. That was good.